Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. It's Christmas time! It's the most wonderful time of the year, everybody, which means we need to celebrate. And I think we'll start the festivities off with the most Christmassy of all franchises, Hellraiser! Clive Barker's Hellraiser series is more or less about the Cenobites, creatures that, as their leader Pinhead would say, are demons to some, <laughs> angels to others. And by that he means, like, maybe once or twice in the sequels they remember that they're supposed to be neutral beings. Otherwise, yeah, they're just demons who could really use some band-aids. The idea behind them is that they're beings who keep trying to explore deeper and deeper sensations of hedonistic pleasure, but they've gone so far that they're no longer able to distinguish between pain and pleasure. And of course, they're more than happy to assist people in exploring those realms of gratification, usually with hooks and chains and, well, ripping your flesh apart. Just hear those sleigh bells jingling, ring ting tingling too. The other recurring element of the Hellraiser series is the method of summoning the Cenobites, a puzzle box called the Lament Configuration. But while Cenobites exist in every movie, the only recurring one across the franchise is Pinhead, played eight out of nine times by Doug Bradley. Like Freddy Krueger, he's a horror movie monster who talks a lot, but unlike Freddy's gleeful puns and bouncy personality, Pinhead is mostly reserved and stationary. All of his words are meant to carry weight behind them, and he's not really known for laughing maniacally. Well, most of the time, anyway. I am the way. <laughs> so, like with any popular franchise, there are naturally comic book tie-ins, and Hellraiser is no different, with the first coming from Marvel imprint Epic Comics. Epic, you may recall, was the line meant for creator-owned material with potentially more mature content than they could fit in the regular Marvel Universe, as well as a licensing plant for translations of some non-English works, like a few from French creator Mobius, as well as the classic Akira. Epic originally ended thanks to the speculator boom crashing in the mid-90s, but of course was brought back after the ending of Marvel, with the idea to use it to scout for new talent. And that resulted in trouble, both the book and for the line in general. But back in the late 80s, early 90s, Epic would have been a perfect fit for Hellraiser. Then, in 1992, somebody thought, Hey, I got an idea! Hellraiser Holiday Special! And nobody stopped them. The Epic Comics Hellraiser series was an anthology book. According to the introduction to the first issue, they sat down with Clive Barker and hammered out a more complex mythology around the Cenobites and the Lament Configuration. Or rather, Configurations Plural, a framework for all of their stories to follow. And thus this series was born, with a few Hellraiser short stories in each issue that explored various different Cenobites and people who sought the box, or similar bizarre puzzles, for any number of reasons. In preparation for this review, I read or skimmed through the 20 issues and... they're pretty damn good, actually. Most of the stories are fairly original while still exploring various themes of horror, in particular Lovecraftian fears of unknown, unknowable powers that the Lament configuration can access, or at the very least introducing new Cenobite variations, a few times having the same ones return for different stories, for better and for worse. And with that, let's dig into Clive Barker's Hellraiser Dark Holiday Special and see what sights it has to show us. cover is alright, showing off a dark holiday image of a pair of kids, reflected in a mirror, having solved the lament configuration and summoned Santa Cenobite. Pinhead himself, who looks like he accidentally bit his lip and is bleeding all over a fake beard. And geez, Pinhead, just because you've taken on the role of Santa doesn't mean you had to eat all the milk and cookies. Just saying, if you really wanted to become Santa, you've certainly got the figure for it now. And I hope you enjoyed that single appearance of Pinhead! On the cover, because he ain't in this book! Like with the series itself, this comic is an anthology, just one with a framing device centered on three particular Cenobites from the series, whom I'll explain in a bit. We open on a card that reads, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men. 
that apparently has a real smoking problem given what's coming out of it. Man, the holidays always blow chow! Like this, stuck in an effin' soup kitchen Christmas Eve! I remember one time, right? My two brothers, Keith and Peter, they get their asses out of bed 0530, 0600 hours, Greedy sons of bitches. They sneak downstairs scoping what Santa brought them that year. Turns out Santa was already ready for them and had set up landmines. But the fat man's haul wasn't enough for them, oh no. They went right into every other present under the tree, ripping and tearing open boxes from whoever to whoever. They got really confused by the underwear in my mom's present for dad. And who catches the most crap? Me, that's who. Some BS about my being the oldest and should have been setting an example. I should have been the one ripping apart the presents at 4 a.m. I was setting an example. I was still in bed having wet dreams of Babs Degregati. My brothers should have had massive erections for obscure Marvel characters. And obscure is right. Holy crap, I had never heard of this person before, so I did a Google search, figuring it'd be some random celebrity I'd never heard of. And the only result I really get is that Babs Degregati appeared in Powerline number four. I still have no idea who the hell this person is and why this guy would be fantasizing about her. But who is Captain Complainy Pants here? Well, allow me to introduce you to the three Cenobites now occupying a soup kitchen full of chains and dead bodies. So eventually, despite being an anthology, there was for a time an ongoing story in the Hellraiser comics, an 18-part saga spread out over a bunch of issues. One of the revisions made about the Cenobites is that they exist to spread order via their god, a giant diamond named Leviathan featured in the second movie. A prediction is made that the forces of chaos may overpower order on Earth, something that could somehow result in the destruction of hell itself. Leviathan charges a group of Cenobites, called the Devil's Brigade, to deal with a few specific circumstances when society could be on the verge of order versus chaos. The thing is that this has nothing to do with good or evil, just that order has to win out. So, for instance, they put equivalent weight to a country undergoing an ethnic cleansing as long as it was orderly, as much as a guy creating a series of homeless shelters because the homeless running amok without a place to go is chaotic. Which seems to indicate that you can piss off the forces of hell by just knocking over a cup full of pencils. These three were members of the Devil's Brigade. The first is Face, whose deal is, what if Lon Chaney Sr. was a Cenobite? No, I'm not kidding. His backstory is basically that he's Lon Chaney with a different name who cut off people's faces to create new characters for himself, so he's all about acting and performances and stuff. He's probably the most reoccurring Cenobite in the anthology and the most developed as a result. The one who looks like Maz Kanata from The Force Awakens if she grew a beehive haircut is Balbareth, essentially Hell's librarian. She's the least developed among the three here and doesn't really have anything that interesting to note about about her. But then there's our last Cenobite, who you may notice looks a bit, um, Doom Marine. This is Atkins, a Vietnam War soldier who crawled into a series of tunnels in Vietnam that turned out to be a puzzle that he inadvertently solved, being recruited into the Cenobites for whatever reason. He was the one giving that monologue before, and as you can see, he is a gun-toting, bare-chested, headband-wearing, teeth-gritting, angry 90s anti-hero Cenobite. Dude, this is what the Hellraiser series needed, man! We needed a character who could actually raise some hell! Like, would you ever look at this guy and think he was a Cenobite? A zombie soldier, maybe, what with the pale skin. But seriously, someone thought that this was a good idea? Oh wait, he's got a kneecap with a skull on it. That fixes everything. Are we the baddies? And if Clive Barker really was involved in a lot of this, he must have approved of this. I have seen the future of horror. And it includes a guy waving around a huge, nonsensical gun. And no, he was not really any better in the actual series either. He's completely incongruous with the rest of the Hellraiser aesthetic. Not even the worst of the direct-to-DVD movies in the series had something this out of place. And one of them involves a dumb Hellraiser Flash game! In any event, let's move on with the framing story here. How tragic, Atkins. 
that you can only find self-pity in a time of year so rich with dramatic tradition. Listen to the rattle of the chains. Hear in them the voice of Marley calling out to Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, sorry, Face, but I think the connection's a bit weak. Man, my next chains need to have a really good 4G plan. Balbareth says that Leviathan has charged them with investigating this unsanctioned attack on mankind. Balbareth's got it! We don't work out this puzzle fast! That bastard Black Diamond's gonna pin this whole mess on us so as to wrap things up nice and orderly-like! Which is why he sent me, an unstable hothead whose only other job I've done for Leviathan, I not only screwed up, but actually made worse! We have such sights to show you! Atkins finds a lament configuration among the presents under a Christmas tree, but clearly this one is different, as indicated by the colored corners and less intricate geometric designs on it. Atkins thinks the box alone explains everything. Somebody got obsessed with solving it and accidentally summoned hell upon everyone. Unfortunately, my research indicates it's not quite that simple. Rain on my parade, librarian, and I'll bleed you dry down the nearest gutter. Let me tell you something, old lady. We'll tear your soul apart with bullets! As I said, in the series, the Lament configuration was just one of many possible puzzle devices, but according to Balbareth's guidebook to these objects, the one they have isn't listed. It would seem the Devil's Mark has been sacrificed in favor of one reading Made in Taiwan. And of course, the Devil's Mark should be made by EA. Examining it further, Faye says that the box is an imitation, yet he can sense the story behind it, leading us into the first proper story of the anthology, Child's Play. Okay, I had never really thought of Chucky versus Pinhead as a possibility, but I'm willing to see where this goes. A guy runs up to an elevator, cursing in his head before the elevator opens, and he finds himself suspended in the air naked by several hooks in his back. For the sake of the holidays, and my lack of desire to see this video get flagged, I will not show that part. But I will show you the Cenobites responsible for this, including Conehead and Reneducation here, who are trying to decide what note he's hitting as he screams. Hmm, F sharp, do you suppose? Indeed! High C will he reach with one more notch, I believe. Man, somewhere Fezzik and Inigo Montoya are hearing the screams this guy is making and are like, dude, let's just. Let's go the other way. The guy pleads to be let out, but of course the Cenobites explain that he opened the box and nobody escapes them. He counters that he could totally be a Cenobite. Not good enough for heaven, nor bad enough to become a Cenobite. But I've, I've cheated. I've stolen. Whoa, look out, Pinhead. We got a badass over here. I mean, I saw a Cenobite who was only a torso with no eyes and his mouth stretched open while his teeth endlessly chattered. But you? You stole something. I've committed adultery. You know, at least Atkins of all Cenobites killed people. And screw you, dude. You just made me defend Atkins over you. Conehead asks if he's ever dragged an innocent soul down to hell, and that sparks an idea in the guy. He says that if they let him go, he can get them thousands of innocent souls. You don't even know what you're doing. You've got this half-assed distribution system. All you need is some marketing! I can get your boxes to children all over the country! Think of all those unspoiled souls! The truth behind loot boxes. The two think it's a neat idea, but it's also an idea that would create too much chaos and disorder. So he proposes something else. How about focus groups? Smaller groups of kids testing out toys so the effects of a bunch of missing children would be minimized. They agree to give it a shot and send him back to Earth. As such, he's soon meeting with his boss to discuss his new idea for a product. The Lemarchand box. Sort of a puzzle cube. They've been around for centuries, but nobody's ever tried to market them before, so we can get them dirt cheap. And then it turns out Disney owns it already. Now, I know what you're gonna say. The Rubik's Cube fad ended years ago. I say let's combine them! But this thing will outsell Rubik's Cube because it's got an extra hook to it. It's a suppository. Each one's got a surprise inside. Unfortunately, his idea was to have a Kinder Egg inside of it. His boss thinks there's merit in the idea. 
He at first wants to give him a month to make a complete product presentation and marketing strategy for it, but he insists on going in with it at the next focus group testing the following week. Interestingly, the last panel of the page is him grimly closing his eyes. It's not really explained why he's doing this, but I see two possible interpretations. That he's thinking about how if this doesn't work, he's royally screwed. But also, it could be a twinge of guilt over the fact that he's planning on sacrificing a bunch of children to save his own neck. Then again, either option probably means he's fired, so maybe it's that. And indeed, a week was all he needed, as the boss congratulates him on the work he's done already. Audience demographics, marketing ideas, even a springboard for a Saturday morning cartoon! Before anyone wonders how the hell you make a cartoon out of the Lament configuration, here's a quick reminder of the existence of Rubik the Amazing Cube. However, he's soon distraught when he spots the goofy-looking box we saw in the soup kitchen sitting on the table in the focus group room. His boss explains that the legal department says that they can't trademark the box if it's been around for so long, so instead they made these cheap plastic knockoffs of the puzzle box with a different design. As such, Steve has to run up to his office, grab the real puzzle box, and slam it down into the focus group area before the kids get in, much to his boss's utter confusion. And indeed, the kids find the box and immediately toss it aside because puzzle boxes are corny. Instead, the kids decide to play with action figures based on the two Cenobites. And given the articulation level I can see from even just the drawing, yeah, that's definitely better. Hell, I bet you can make them crash test dummies too, that'd be awesome. The two Cenobites reappear to him, his boss not seeing their arrival. Steve claims they cheated him. Oh please, Steven. Free enterprise, remember? Steve, you fool, you've taught demons the value of capitalism! In any event, he's dragged back into the hell torture room, now with hooks on both sides of his body. After all, you forgot the cardinal rule of business. Always watch out for the competition! Wait, does that mean that the two are employed by that same toy company? Now I just have this image in my head of a Cenobite having to wear a business suit and sit in a cubicle while someone complains about having a case of the Mondays. Back to the framing story, they need to deal with this knockoff puzzle box. All right, Facey, pull! And Face tosses it in the air for Atkins to shoot at with his massive gun. Bastard troublemaking plastic ass made in some third word pisshole bogus box! The box. You opened it. And I shot at it! I guess the counterfeit puzzle box wasn't responsible for this, since the three are still speculating on what caused the massacre. They find a small golem statue. But no record of this golem statue ever being approved for service in Leviathan's War on the Flesh! That's odd! I can't find any record of my Titan's Return Soundwave being approved for this operation either! Balbera says there's a hellish essence within the golem statue, and Atkins licks some blood off a knife. Ew, Atkins, you don't know whose blood that is! Unless it's your own, in which case, why? Anyway, Balbareth tells the tale of the golem statue, called Shedim, which, from what brief research I did, is basically the Hebrew word for a demon or a supernatural creature. The story takes place in Albany in 1938, where a father is coming home with his son from morning prayers at Temple. The son has been trying to make a golem out of pieces of trash. Man, Golden Age Neutro had a very different origin than the Silver Age version. The son, Jacob, asks his father if golems were real, but his father just shrugs. Have I seen one? No, but then again, I never needed one. Mind you, I was one of the lucky kids who had a vampire for a friend. He reveals to his son that they have a secret in their family, a duty to God that they have to fulfill, and brings out a lament configuration. For 400 years, they've kept it secret. Before anyone raises their hand about the continuity flub with that, since the box was supposed to have been made only 200 years before, remember that this came out before Hellraiser Bloodline, and even then it's possible there were other boxes made before Le Marchand's, since the design specifications were given to him. Anyway, the box, according to him, contains Shedim, and that Jacob must never touch it. There's a story that a member of their family long ago opened it, and his screams were heard in the night for six years. On the plus side, his family learned to sleep despite all the noise. That's an admirable skill. Jacob wonders if they could use it to kill Nazis and the Bund in America. Well, actually, he asks if they can use it against the Bunt, making me think he's referring to some kind of evil Nazi baked goods, but I don't know, maybe that spelling works for Bund too. 
However, as his father explains, it's not their power, and that in the past, all the enemies who have tried to kill Jews are just dust now. And thus he makes Jacob promise to guard it and not touch it, like he has it several times during this conversation. Whoops. Anyway, later that day at a bar, some jackasses in a bund are, well, talking crap about Jewish people, and spot Jacob and his father coming by in a wagon. A kid busboy who works for the bar is handed a rock, and, as the bar inhabitants yell at the two, is encouraged to throw it against his better judgment. He tosses the rock at Jacob's father, striking him right in the head and killing him. The cops are unable to do anything since the patrons somehow all have alibis and anyone else there refuses to step forward to be a witness. As such, Jacob decides, screw waiting for time and God to deal with the damn Nazis. Time to go for the demons! As such, he manages to partially activate the box, make it spark, and places it inside his golem. Now, blood for blood, this time we won't wait for God, we'll do it without him! Did you ever hear that the devil built the robot? El Diablo Robotico. Later, something comes out of the shadows and murders two of the people at the bar. The busboy also comes out, worried about how he accidentally killed Jacob's father, and we soon see that the murderer isn't the golem, but Jacob himself, wearing a black glove and stabbing people with a knife. He does the same to the busboy and returns home to the golem, revealing that while he may have started working the configuration, it hasn't actually opened yet to his frustration. However, the police soon arrive and ask him to put the knife down, but he's gone crazy and starts to attack before they shoot him, revealing to each other that a witness had stepped forward and they were preparing to arrest the guys at the bar before he murdered them. However, the story ends on a somewhat happier note, as one of the people from the bar picks up the lament configuration and it begins sparking again, indicating that the Nazi would be in for a hell of a visit. And that's why there's a small golem statue in a soup kitchen. With the story over, Balbareth disables the statue by pulling a small bone from its base, while Atkins continues to be Atkins, locating a dreidel, or possibly just a top. I saw this crap in Nam, and I did this crap in Nam! I never could win that damn chocolate! What he's really talking about is massacres, and I just realized that the bullet belts on him are not actually resting over his shoulders, they're arching over them like some bizarre shoulder decorations. There, sure glad I don't look stupid in this. If there's gonna be killing now, I want a reason for it! That's the deal I cut with that midnight eight-sided thing down below, and I'll be saved before I let whatever's at work here screw with that! Demons to some, angels to others, killing machine to everybody! He picks up a book that was being held by one of the dead bodies and starts reading from it. Listen to this winter wonderland sh**! Sleigh bells ring, are you listening? To my gun! And thus begins our final story, Nursery Crime. It takes place in Oxford in the present, where a father is reading some nursery rhymes to his son. Oh please, Daddy, won't you read it for me again? No. Why not? Because I didn't read it for you at all. I read it for myself. Reading about this little teapot who is short and stout brings me immense comfort, child. The father is being a jackass, saying how he never wanted the kid and that he's bugging him. I am 57 years old, Charles. I have been a professor of British folklore for 25. It's starting to get weird that in all that time you haven't aged a single day. I'm near retirement. It's time for me to start relaxing, take sabbaticals, spend my time reading, traveling. But then you were born, weren't you? And now I'm a damned nursemaid half the time. And my nipples don't produce nearly enough milk anymore. The son, undisturbed by the verbal abuse, asks what the poem he was reading is supposed to mean. For context, the poem goes, The crows fly down to London town, their wings as black as day. The ladies sing in dressing gowns to chase the moon away. Oh, give me please a farthing, sir. Oh, give me please your pay. You cannot spend your money, sir. The crows are here to stay. The damned crows steal your cash in a clever way, you see. Do not act at all rash. They're great at three-card Monty. The mother comes to take the child away, berating her husband, named Edward, for the abuse. He's pissed at her because he thinks she tricked him, claiming to be unable to have children. 
He says he's struggling under the pressure of them only having one salary, but as she points out, they're managing just fine and, well, he is a professor at a college and has a big library full of textbooks, so yeah, the artwork is making it clear he's kind of full of it. Anyway, he thinks to himself about how ever since he found the book, he keeps coming back to that rhyme. The crow poem is the only one he doesn't recognize. The others are all standard nursery rhymes and even explains the meaning behind many of them. Like how little Jack Horner was likely about a steward who stole a manor deed and baked it into a pie. God, we're an odd people. Next thing you know, we'll be inventing a story about a time traveler in a police box. After a little bit of prodding from his son about finding the meaning of the poem, he sets about trying to uncover its origins, his colleagues saying that they'd never seen it before either. Suspecting that it might be a previously undiscovered work, he hopes it'll lead him to some financial success writing a paper on it, and subsequently a folklore book that he can spring into a bigger career. Throughout, his son encourages him to keep working on it, despite him continually telling the kid to stay out of his way. At night, he dreams of a fantasy setting full of a sun in the sky with a face on it, pigs in top hats, satyrs blowing flowers like horns, even fairies dancing, but a dark figure approaches that he can't identify. After oversleeping, he notices that the illustration in the book seems to have changed. The moon in it was facing the crows before, but now it's facing towards him. He finally consults with an historian in the college about it, in particular noting the figure in his dream, which of course the historian identifies as a plague doctor. And since plague doctors somewhat resemble birds, he thinks he has a working theory as to the nursery rhyme. Yes, of course! The crows are carrying the plague doctor to the moon to treat it for an infection and asking it to turn and cough, and it costs a farthing because of their lack of health insurance! Brilliant! No, of course, the whole thing is meant to be symbolic for the plague. The crows are plague doctors, the ladies aren't singing, they're wailing for the dead in mourning clothes, and the money thing is suggesting they give up their cash because it's useless in the afterlife. He doesn't understand what the moon represents. I'm just gonna throw it out there. Probably communist Russia. But he figures he'll deduce it later, instead focusing on writing up his paper. After all these years, all these disappointments, all those shackles put on me by my wife and that hideous child. Yeah, I can see how they really undermined your efforts to... decipher the historical context of a nursery rhyme. Truly, you are now free as a bird! Later, emerging from his study holding a bottle of booze, presumably drunk after writing about how the crows are phallic symbols or something, everything around him seems misty and hazy, his wife frozen in a chair. He finds his son surrounded by candles, and with him, two Cenobites. I'm glad you solved the puzzle, Daddy. That makes me so happy. Now I can send that answer in to the cereal box company and get my decoder ring! The Cenobites are crow and... Moonface. Holy crap! Mac tonight was a Cenobite?! Edward is of course horrified, especially as his son continues. Only they're not people anymore. They used to be people, Daddy. Just like you! And well, then they made a bet with Pinhead over who could shove more inanimate objects in their faces, and well, you can see that didn't end well for them. And thus the story ends with Edward having transformed into a son like in his dream. The same images from his dream now showing off more mutations and grotesqueries. The man in the moon died too soon, all on a summer's day. The man in the sun, he rose for his son. He's with us now to stay. And that poem was written by Leviathan itself. The truth of Leviathan revealed, it's actually just a giant pen tip. Face, somehow caught up in all of this, starts destroying the book frantically, as if chaos was overwhelming him. Balbareth hits him with a book to calm him down, and he thanks her for that. He realizes that the three configurations they've been dealing with were actually tools of anarchy. The puzzle box was a last-minute addition to something that would have otherwise stolen souls, the golem was out of step with the rules and couldn't bring about a Cenobite, and the storybook obsession consumed both the father and son, but the son was allowed to escape that fate for no reason, regardless of the order of things. And thus, with the three objects so close together, it created a field of chaos so large that it led to the soup kitchen slaughtering, somehow. Dalbareth says that this isn't how Leviathan wants the war on flesh to be won, but isn't sure how they can make things right. Atkins has the answer. A skull-shaped grenade. I got just what the trio of crap configurations need right here. C4 explosive! 
with modifications. Let's blow them all straight to hell. We're explorers in the further regions of experience. So let's experience this grenade! And so they plant the explosive amongst the debris of the objects and set it off somehow resetting the soup kitchen back to the way it was before the massacre, minus the objects themselves. The soup kitchen is full of people, with the workers there handing out presents. So like all great Christmas stories, the situation is resolved with explosives. And so our comic ends with the workers throwing some wrapping paper and trash into the fireplace to dispose of it, including a little Christmas card featuring the three Cenobites. Bloody peace on Earth. Strong will to men. This is why we don't let Atkins write the Christmas cards. This comic is a mixed bag, best judged with each story dealt with differently. The framing story sucks. Aside from the fact that there's no reason why these three Cenobites in particular need to investigate this random slaughter, Atkins continues to prove to be the worst idea in the comics and possibly the franchise as a whole. Who thought some random, gravelly, over-the-top, extreme soldier guy would be a good addition to the mythos? The concept of configurations designed to promote chaos and anarchy as opposed to order is interesting, but it's a flimsy pretense to get to the stories. After all, why would some random plastic lament configuration knockoff cause this when even in the story it suggested it couldn't actually do anything? Where did the golem statue come from considering it wasn't in the Shadim story? And they already physically destroyed each of the objects, so why would blowing them up make everything reset? The artwork for the story is fine, but only just fine, especially when compared to the detailed painted artwork in Shadim and Nursery Crime. Speaking of, let's move into the individual stories. Child's Play also has pretty basic artwork, but it's serviceable, especially as a story that's a bit more of a comedy. And despite that, the gruesome parts are still effectively gruesome. As a dark comedy, it works pretty well. A jackass thinking he can outmaneuver the Cenobites, who of course get the better of him by the end. It's fun. Shot him, however, is just a bit depressing. I like the idea of someone failing to summon the Cenobites, with the Lament configuration acting as more of a red herring, but it's just a big tragedy. Good people murdered, no moral redemption for the busboy who was questioning stuff, and poor Jacob going mad with grief until his own death. The artwork is pretty, and there's a gem of a good story in there, but I feel it needed another draft. Nursery Crime, though, is really good. The artwork is nicely realistic, with great atmospheric haze, when appropriate, and full of cool imagery. The story itself showed off how the anthology utilized puzzle mechanisms outside of just the Lament configuration to craft original tales. It's beautifully dark and enjoyable. Here's the problem with them, though. For a book called Dark Holiday Special, only the framing story has anything to do with the holidays! Seriously, the connection to the holidays is tenuous at best, with Child's Play at least having to do with toys, but Shadim and Nursery Crime have nothing at all to do with the season. Hell, you'd think maybe Shadim would be Hanukkah related, but nope! It's like they wanted to feature a story outside of Christmas to justify it being a holiday book, maybe thinking about Hanukkah, but then just got bored and made an unrelated story concerning Jewish people. But hey, the one thing I'll grant it is that the book ends happily with people in a soup kitchen celebrating the season, so it's at least got that going for it over, say, Punisher Silent Night. Next time, the holiday shenanigans continue as we go back to the Golden Age for a Wonder Woman holiday story! So, yeah, like Hellraiser, it'll probably still involve BDSM themes somehow. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. As you can see, I'm kinda tied up with current events post-10th anniversary episode, but hey, it's October, which means we should talk some more about a horror series that I like. As has been established, I like to talk about a particular franchise for three years in a row. The 10th anniversary kind of got in the way of that, but I feel we can slip in a one-shot to start off the next franchise I'll be discussing for another couple years. Hellraiser! If you want some backstory on the series overall, I provided it last year when I covered the Hellraiser Dark Holiday Special. However, that one was based on the series from Epic Comics and had its own comic-only characters inhabiting it. This, however, this is an adaptation of one of the movies. 
one of the bad ones. Although most Hellraiser fans would probably say, well that's not surprising considering only the first two are good. They're not entirely wrong. It all depends on what you're expecting walking into the movies, in my opinion. The first two are masterpieces, and the rest, decidedly not so, but most are pretty enjoyable, in my opinion. The operative word there, mind you, is most. Some of them are still absolutely garbage, specifically Hellworld and Revelations. Just utter trash for a number of reasons that we don't have time to get into. The one we're talking about today is also trash, but less trash, admittedly. Hellraiser 3 is not good. It has some good elements, some good lines, but there's a noticeable step down in quality right off the bat, and a lot of it can be aimed at the series' villain, Pinhead. Pinhead was not supposed to be the face of the franchise. It's just that he grew insanely popular after the first movie. As I said in the Holiday Special review, he's another villain who talks, but there's a regal quality to him, a restrained presence that makes everything he says have weight behind it. Hellraiser 3, unfortunately, has him talking way too much, laughing maniacally, and just generally being silly for no good reason. It has a weird tonal problem where it's trying way, way too hard to go over the top when the first two movies had this kind of uncomfortable darkness to them as they dealt with desire, torment, and pain. But we'll explore more of that as we talk about the story. Let's dig into the comic adaptation of Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. Quick recap of the story so far. After Kirstie Cotton's encounters with the Cenobites in the first movie, she went to a mental hospital run by Dr. Chenard. Chenard, obsessed with the lament configuration and gaining access to hell, resurrected Kirstie's stepmother Julia, the two entering hell with Kirstie going along for the ride too. Chenard got transformed into a Cenobite and seemingly killed Pinhead and his entourage. After he was defeated, the bloody mattress used to resurrect Julia had a person get sucked into it, and I guess that resulted in a terrible process shot of a demonic torture pillar spinning out of it. And most of that has nothing to do with the movie. Really, only the pillar is relevant, and only just barely, as you'll soon see. The cover is pretty good, actually, depicting a decent sequence from the movie where Pinhead murders a whole bunch of people in a club, with hooks and chains coming out as people run screaming in terror. It's an effective cover and draws the eye with more implied horror than with anything so directly gory, like how Avatar comics would have operated. Still, gotta love Pinhead's pose and expression on here. Hey guys, check out my Frankenstein impression! The official adaptation of the hit horror sequel. There are less official adaptations, but they're of the version that was not a hit. We open on a shot of the pillar from the last movie. Sort of. See, this is kind of what I mean about the relevancy of the pillar. At the end of the second movie, it's this hideous abomination full of flesh and writhing body parts and hellish glows. And here it's just kind of a statue. Not sure what happened in between movies for the thing to petrify, but man, Hell's craftsmanship has really gone downhill if it gets stale that quickly. Night is falling in a forgotten part of the city. Nobody has business here. Then again, it is zoned for residential. A man enters a storefront labeled Pyramid. I should have known! Of course the demonic aspects of the Cenobites would be associated with the most evil force that threatens us all! ANCIENT EGYPT! The man spots the pillar amongst a group of other statues and paintings, a scruffier looking fellow walking up to him. You want it? Is it yours? Not mine. Yours. You actually bought it like three months ago. When the hell are you gonna pick it up? He does indeed buy it. Will this do it? Exactly the amount I had in mind. Five hundred dollars in Monopoly money. That was just a prologue, and we begin Act 1 at a hospital, where we meet Joey Summerskill, played in the movie by Star Trek Deep Space Nine actress Terry Farrell. She's a reporter doing a... story, I guess, at said hospital. Most nights, an inner-city ER would be a chaos of blood and panic and grace under pressure. Most nights that would be the case? What the hell is going on with this city? It sounds like they don't even need Pinhead! But tonight, it's like death took a holiday. It's a mystery to me. Well, not to me. Have you met the guy who's taken over the hospital? You two are, without a doubt, the worst co-chief residents of all time. A mystery how those assholes at news assignments knew it. What was the story assignment exactly? Yeah, most nights the ER is a dark nightmare of bleeding and dying people will go down there and talk about it in front of their screaming faces. 
But yeah, apparently there is no story going on, and she tells her cameraman, Doc, to just cut the camera. He tries to put a positive spin on it, but then gets summoned away to cover a hostage situation. Joey stays behind a sulk, but he probably should have stuck around, since a patient arrives at the ER, one with chains covering his body. Well, wrapped around his body and the gurney he's lying on. What the hell? The doctors are trying to remove the chains and prep him for surgery as the woman who is with him is left behind in the lobby with Joey. Joey tries to talk to her, but all she can get out of her is that whatever happened with the guy, it happened outside a club called the Boiler Room. Oh hey, Freddy Krueger finally retired and started up his own nightclub. But yeah, before she can learn anything more, Joey spots the body, which is practically floating up in the air as the chains embedded in him start electrifying and he dies. Ugh, I don't think his insurance is gonna cover that. The next morning, one of Joey's producers is being a sexist asshat, suggesting that she'd actually get more airtime and good assignments if she showed more skin in her interviews. It may be a surprise to you, Brad, but I want to do it the right way. Tight stories, not tight skirts. Open-ended questions, not open blouses. Right, like last night's doozy. I know what I saw. TV. No pictures, no story. And it would be impossible for any of the doctors or nurses to corroborate the story. I mean, what do you think you are, reporters? Joey insists there's a story and will investigate it on her own time. She heads to her only lead, the Boiler Room Club. The coolest place this side of heaven. The hottest place this side of hell. The lukewarm, moderately temperate place this side of purgatory. Joey meets the owner of the club and purchaser of the pinhead pillar, J.P. Monroe. She asks about the girl from the hospital and he just hits on her. And all I can think of is, wow, he actually looks slightly less douchey than he does in the movie. I mean, I do instinctively hate him, but only because the artwork on him bizarrely enough reminds me of Paul Gulacy's from Sci Spy. I think it's all in the puffy lips the artist gave him. As it happens, the comic also improves upon a bizarre aesthetic from the movie. The club is of course a loud, grungy place full of rock and roll and dark lights and all, but JP also apparently owns a restaurant attached to the club, which is quiet, romantic, and sophisticated with a small group of violinists playing classical music. I get the impression that the movie was trying to present JP as this smarmy jackass who thinks he's sophisticated and rich, even though he's clearly a bro with too much money, but it just comes across as weird that these two different places are linked like this. For one thing, the soundproofing must be amazing for the restaurant to not hear any of the hard rock music playing. In the comic, it's just depicted as him being in the club. In any case, JP just throws out her card when she asks her to find the girl, but said girl then picks up the card. That night, Joey dreams of walking through a battlefield in Vietnam, until she's woken up by her phone ringing. Yeah, this is Joanne Summerskill. Joey, who is this? He, like, left me a card? At the club? You told me to call you whenever you were dreaming of Vietnam? The woman, Terry, says that she'll talk to Joey if she can crash at her place. Which seems like a bit much, but hey, she wants the story. Since she mentioned having a bad dream on the phone, Terry inquires about it. It's my father. He died before I was born. Before I was conceived, even. Mom said it had something to do with time travel. She explains that she dreams of searching for him on battlefields. Terry says that she's curious about dreams because she's never had any before. Oh great, of course Freddy Krueger opens up a club right when we find someone immune to him. They talk for a little bit, have some character building conversations, but then get around to the main topic at hand, the guy who died at the hospital. She didn't really know him, but he came out of the club clutching something that he took from the pillar. She held onto it after he- oh jeez, dear lord, what happened to the lament configuration? Not even just that it looks pretty banged up, but it's huge! It's like the size of her head! Also, her hairstyle suddenly changed between panels. The lament configuration is friggin' warping reality! Um, anyway, the guy apparently said that the chains came out of the box. Which is why it makes sense that you held on to it. The next day at the boiler room, JP notices a hole in the statue where the box had been located and reaches into it. A rat apparently decided to call it home and bites into his hand. It draws blood, and instead of being over the top like it was in the movie, with him swinging his arm around with whooshing sounds added, he just pulls his hand away and blood splatters onto Pinhead's... 
head and blood getting sucked into the statue. This makes JP turn into a Junji Ito drawing. As we enter Act 2, we have some more banter between Joey and Terry, where she reveals that she was the one who found the statue pillar for JP and can even bring Joey out to the place where they found it. The sign says it's been closed for a month, but of course they were only there last week. Breaking in, they go through some paperwork that they find, of course recognizing that for an art gallery, it's a scam. They buy the pieces for pennies and then resell them. One of the places they bought it from, though, was the Chenard Institute, even finding diagrams of the box. Well, at least they kept the receipt. Their hellish torture puzzle device is a tax write-off. At the club, JP hits on a blonde woman. You're JP Monroe, right? And this is your club? Great club. I really love it here. Great club. Thanks. A rose. Wow, that's really nice. Gotta give the adaptation this. They really did capture the terrible acting in the movie. After managing to acquire interview tapes from the Chenard Institute, Joey invites Terry to stay with her as long as she likes. Back at the boiler room, or rather a loft above the boiler room, JP has finished having sex with the blonde woman. Upstairs at the boiler room, the private lair of a very special predator. Pinhead versus the predator didn't end up being what everyone thought it would. JP wants the woman to get out now that he's done sleeping with her, but chains come out of the statue and grab hold of her. Jesus Christ! Not quite. Quite frankly, Jesus looks way better as a statue. Although to be honest, the artwork in the comic is much improved at depicting Pinhead's face coming out of the statue than it is in the movie, which just looked absolutely silly every time I saw it. Like, there's no way around it. It looks like a dude sticking his face through a hole in some foam. The first Hellraiser had a budget of one million dollars, and this one was estimated to be around three to five million, yet the effects in that one are a thousand times better. Yes, even the visible trolley for the engineer looks better than this. In the movie, there's also this very bad visual effect where after her skin gets pulled off, she gets sucked into the pillar. Here, the body is just skinned off panel and left on the ground. Naturally, JP's a little shocked by this. What did you see? The same as I. Appetite sated. Oh dude, you only wanted the skin? You're leaving all the tasty meat behind! Desire indulged. A miniature of the world and how it will succumb to us. With your brains and my beauty, you enjoyed the girl, and so did I. And that's all. No, it's not the same. That was evil! Also, I'm talking to a statue, and that's kind of weird too, but that was evil, bro! How uncomfortable that word must feel on your lips. Personally, the word moist is pretty uncomfortable for me. There is no good, Monroe. There is no evil. There is only the flesh, and the patterns to which we submit. As for me, I submit to plaid. JP pulls out a gun. I'm touched. That is the gun you used to kill your parents. I understand. Their fortune was so tempting, their affection so conditional. What, did they only love him if he cleaned his room? He shoots the statue, and unfortunately they keep the stupid bit of Pinhead spitting out the bullets. It looks just as goofy here. Like what, did he aim them all at his mouth? Or did the statue absorb the bullets and move them into his mouth to expel? Finished? Good. Shall we talk sensibly? For starters, can you move me over to the window? I really miss having a view. Pinhead explains that together, the two can raise some mayhem and gain power and glory. It even includes some dialogue that didn't make it into the film that references the second movie, while also explaining a little bit of what's up with him. I am a dark star rising. Bound to another system by a soul I once possessed, my god was diamond and black light, and I his dark pope. You don't even want to know what we used for communion wafers. JP agrees, and we get this good shot of him and Pinhead as if they were two halves of the same being. I actually like it. Later, Joey gets a tape from the Chenard Institute, courtesy of Doc, who also mentions that she's put in for a news anchor gig in Monterey. Reviewing the tape, Joey sees footage of Kirsty, a cameo from her actress, explaining about the Cenobites in the box. Nothing much to comment on here. It's a cool thing to be in the movie, and is a nice connection to the previous films, especially in light of having a new protagonist. That being said, the comic actually adds a bit more to her dialogue and a continuity error. She mentions that she saw dozens of puzzle boxes in Chenard's office. One, no, she saw three of them, not dozens. Two, she saw them in his house, not his office. 
And three, I got the impression that this was from her time at the Institute before she went to his house. Since as soon as she gets there, the movie doesn't have her go back to being a patient. Movie was over, she and Tiffany left for greener pastures. Did she get put back into the Institute afterwards? Back at her apartment, Terry gets a phone call from JP. She wonders how he got the number. Your little girlfriend left cards all over the club, remember? Yes, but how did you know the two were staying together? We get the impression that JP was abusive to her and he's trying to get her to come back, but she refuses. However, there's a voicemail that soon comes in from the station in Monterey informing Joey that she got the job. In the movie, it's Doc calling to let her know and joking about getting her apartment. Either way, the result is Terry decides to go back to JP. But either way, also confuses me. Joey was applying for a job before she met Terry, and the impression I get from both was they both knew she'd only be staying there temporarily, so why wouldn't Terry talk to Joey first before deciding to run off like this? Hell, even if she had to leave sooner than expected, she's not gonna leave right away, and that gives you a few more days with a roof over your head. That night, after another nightmare, Joey spots something else. A bald man speaking to her through her TV. You have to help me, Joey. Man, the ghosts from Poltergeist have really changed their M.O. JP's attempts at seducing Terry take a turn for the worse when Pinhead decides to speak and ruin the whole thing. She manages to knock JP out and tries to run off, but Pinhead, ever the opportunist, speaks to her. Why run? Do you know where you are? You're at the door of dreams. At the base is the doggy door of dreams. He tempts her with the prospect of dreams, but only if she pulls JP's body closer. In the movie, it leads to an hilarious sequence where she tries and fails to pull him over closer, before finally just kind of shoving him over with her legs. And all I can imagine is Pinhead going like, Look, look, just... No, you're doing it wrong. Oh, I... Oh, for the love of... In the comic, it's just two panels, and he's grabbed by his chains, and even including a callback to the first movie. I have such sights to show you. Pinhead proceeds to take him on a world tour of exotic locales. The statue collapses, with apparently Pinhead just being surrounded by the stone and otherwise fully complete and assembled inside of it, like he's the secret Kinder Egg toy inside of the thing. Back to Joey, she has another dream, but this time she looks out her window and sees a man playing with the puzzle box, moving past him until she meets the man who is playing with the puzzle, Captain Elliot Spencer. He explains that her dreams of her father in another war allowed him to contact her. Captain Spencer was a soldier in World War I. After the war, having seen so much horror, while his compatriots found comfort in alcohol, he went in search of forbidden pleasures until he found the puzzle box. It transformed him into Pinhead, but Pinhead is more like a demon possessing him. It needs a human to act as its shell and prison. Monster as I was, I was bound by laws. For one thing, I wasn't allowed to go to Mindy St. Clair's house without the proper paperwork. Hell has its commandments, too. Thou shalt always take pictures of thy genitals and send them to people. Captain Spencer says the puzzle box is a way to bring him back to hell, and he'll seek it out to make sure it can't be used against him. What's more, he can't just take the box, it needs to be given to him. Back at the boiler room, Pinhead emerges from the loft and begins sending out chains. In the comic, we don't actually see the massacre, and I'm of mixed feelings about that. In the movie, it gives us some good gore and the excellent shot of the blood slowly emerging from under the door as the screams fall silent, but on the other hand, the sequence has some ridiculous stuff, like the ice kill. When Joey heads out there, thanks to her unplugged TV displaying a news broadcast about it, we see the aftermath of it, which is kind of creepier than actually seeing it in action. Our imagination is always going to come up with a better sequence than what they can actually depict, and indeed, it looks like hell passed through the club. She had also called Doc for help, and he got there first and was decapitated with his head replaced by a camera. I don't like this new origin for Arnim Zola. Pinhead appears to Joey. There's a secret song at the center of the world, Joey, and its sound is like razors through flesh. It's a Maroon 5 song. I don't believe you! Okay, fine, it's a 303 song, but does anyone even remember them? Like, what does she even mean she doesn't believe him? She doesn't believe in his poetic dialogue about a secret song at the center of the world? Feels like dialogue is missing where he's making a different sort of claim. In any case, she says she's there to send him back to hell. 
and then runs away without trying to use the box. It'd be one thing if he, like, sent chains after her or something and she was fleeing that, but all he's doing is standing around pontificating. Anyway, yeah, she runs off, but is chased not by Pinhead himself, but his pseudo cenobites that he quickly constructed, starting with Doc who just has a camera in his head that he uses to drill into the forehead of some bystander. You just know that this is how I'm gonna go out, murdered by my own camera and the footage uploaded to YouTube. Worst part is the algorithm still won't promote it. Next up is the dumbest of the pseudo Cenobites, as I hinted at in the Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash The Nightmare Warriors comic. CD Head, or just CD as he's apparently officially known, he has CDs in his head, and a CD player in his chest with which he removes CDs and throws them like shurikens. So if this had been made like five or ten years earlier, would this guy have cassette tapes in his head and cassettes in his chest that he launched out to kill people? Okay, I know I just technically described Soundwave, but Soundwave is actually cool. There's also Barbie, who despite the name, is actually not related to the doll at all. It's because he used to be the bartender at the boiler room. He even gets to shoot fire out of his mouth and toss gasoline at people to ignite. Police soon arrive to try to stop them, and they all die. What's weird to me is that the cops are even summoned, considering in the movie the area is a friggin' ghost town. There's barely anyone around, and who we do see is killed before they can do anything. Joey flees into a church, where she explains to the minister that she needs to lead Pinhead into her apartment window, which... Why? Spencer earlier said she had the ability to cross into other worlds, hence how she could communicate with him. That also didn't make sense, given how he contacted her, but whatever. But why isn't her apartment window that's so special for that? But yeah, this leads to the other memorable part of the movie in the church. I am the way. <laughs> It's the perfect encapsulation of the misstep with Pinhead in this movie, laughing like an idiot and being over the top. In the comic, though, he says, I am the way, twice for no particular reason, and while he still does some over-the-top gesturing, he doesn't start laughing, so it's a step up. From there, Joey flees into a construction site, where JP and Terry are now there, also turned into pseudo cenobites. I can dream now, Joey. Oh, you wouldn't believe what I can dream of now. Mostly dreams of me showing up to school in my underwear. Can you believe it? Joey finally figures out how to use the puzzle box, which sucks all the pseudo cenobites inside. So yeah, I guess the apartment window wasn't necessary at all. However, a vision suddenly hits Joey of her father finally getting to meet her. She thinks it's a reward for what she's done. But, of course, it's Pinhead in disguise, and she accidentally hands the puzzle box over to him. Before he can do anything more, though, Spencer shows up and merges with Pinhead. He says her father would be proud of her and disappears. In the movie, she instead has to stab him with a transformed puzzle box after the merging, because Pinhead is still super evil for no reason. After all, wasn't the entire point of them having to merge again was that it was because he restrained Pinhead? And like the rest of the film, Pinhead dies in a ludicrous, over-the-top, and silly-looking way sucked back into the box. And so our comic ends with Joey taking the puzzle box and dipping it into some wet cement at the construction site. And two years later, we see that the building that was under construction now has the box's sides plastered everywhere, which would lead into Hellraiser 4. A movie that everybody loves and certainly doesn't spend a third of its time in outer space. Although personally, I like it. This comic does not suck, actually. Yeah, I'm as surprised as you guys are. I wanted to do this one primarily because Hellraiser 3 is such a terrible movie in the franchise, but this is one of those very rare cases where the comic adaptation is better than the movie. Now don't get me wrong, it still contains some of the problems of the movie, some confusing or dumb plot points, the pseudo Cenobites, and most especially not a particularly strong character arc for Joey. She just kind of stumbles into this plot and nothing is resolved about her. However, it also improves greatly upon many of the flaws of the film. JP is less of a smug dork like he is in the movie, coming across now more disinterested in the world, aside from some basic carnal pleasures that give him some brief satisfaction, which makes the idea of him siding with Pinhead more reasonable, craving the pleasures he offers. The artwork is darker and moodier, matching up better to the aesthetics of the first two movies, as opposed to the over-the-top, more cartoonish aspects of the film. Some of the dumber parts of the film have been pared down or given better expansions that help make them feel less head-scratching. This is by no means the Hellraiser 3 that fans would have wanted after how great the first two were, 
but it's certainly a step in the right direction towards it. Next time, although we'll see if there is a next time, Secret Origins Month begins. A Marvel-filled one. Hello and welcome to a shock the fourth wall! <laughs> The season of fear is upon us again! The season of tricks and treats, of spooks and specters! There's a chill in the air as the orange leaves fall, a harbinger of the approach of Halloween. And it's time for some spoopy fun aside from that asshole in the supply room. So, what's different with a Shock the Fourth Wall from the regular show? Well, functionally nothing. You're still getting reviews of terrible comics, but it's good for marketing because it's a lot more memorable to say, Oh man, I can't wait for this year's a Shock the Fourth Wall, than it is to say, Oh man, I can't wait for a Top the Fourth Wall's Halloween episodes that feature, like, you know, scarier comics than normal. Branding, kids! Because it's shorter to say. Time for our second year of covering Hellraiser comics. What's that, gentle viewer whom I can't possibly hear? This is only the first? Well, technically not. While the 10th anniversary celebrations were meant to be follow-ups to everything I'd done before, I slipped in a Hellraiser review to be the first of our three years going into it. Sometimes I cheat like that. Before you get upset that I am depriving you of a full year of terrible Hellraiser comics, allow me to explain. The thing is, unlike Silent Hill, The Thing, or even Nightmare on Elm Street, Hellraiser has fared pretty damn well in comic form, with a much better track record of good books regardless of the company producing them. Not all good, mind you. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about them on this show if they were all great. But overall, Hellraiser has actually done pretty well for itself in the graphic novel realm. I mean, for crying out loud, the comic I covered last year, an adaptation of Hellraiser 3, a movie that is flawed at best was considerably better than the movie for a number of reasons. So yeah, last year counted as our first year of covering Clive Barker's masterpiece, and this will be our follow-up. And if you still feel deprived, recall that a few years back I also covered the Hellraiser Holiday Special, so you've still got some more of the requisite chains and Cenobites to make you happy plus an introduction on the Hellraiser franchise in general. But of course, while the focus is on bad comics, this year will likely have some more good than usual, because we're covering Hellraiser comics printed under Marvel's old epic line. You know, the one that would eventually be resurrected, so books like Trouble could be made. You can decide which is scarier, Hellraiser or Trouble. Epic's Hellraiser comics were, most of the time, anthology books, expanding the mythos of the franchise by introducing different kinds of puzzles, not necessarily the Lament configuration, as well as exploring the idea behind Cenobites, their purpose, and a whole slew of recurring Cenobites rather than just Pinhead and whatever weirdos he's decided to work for him this week. A lot of them are very good! And just as many are Atkins, the Cenobite who's just some military guy obsessed with guns and shooting and being aggressive. Because when I think of the dark, hellish, demonic figures of the Hellraiser franchise, and the people who find themselves attracted to the Lament configuration, wanting to experience sensations beyond what a mortal mind can comprehend, I think of Rambo, duh. So I decided as a quick sampler of the regular anthology stuff from Epic Comics, we're gonna take a gander at the very first Hellraiser comic ever made. So let's dig into Clive Barker's Hellraiser number one and see what sights they had to show us. Expect me to reuse that line a lot, it lends itself to this. The covers for the regular series were very much like what we see here. A weird kind of skull wall pattern in the background, and then a portrait of what should probably have been the actual cover in a smaller box. And behold, the only time we're gonna see Pinhead this month! Yeah, seriously, none of the books I'm covering this October have Pinhead as a character in any of them. Maybe that's why he looks so pissed off. Or more likely, he was stopped yet again by his arch nemesis, David Spade. Okay, let me take a look-see at the list. Hmm, no Pinhead. Could it be under Nailhead? We begin with... The Cannons of Pain. Also known as, what happens when you play Pachelbel's Cannon in the wrong key. 
We see a group of knights kneeling in prayer over countless dead bodies. Uh, guys, I hate to say this, but I think the church picnic might have gotten out of hand. The Levant, the holiest of holy lands. Since the death of Christ, the site of countless crusades to return his artifacts to the true seat of civilization and learning in the world. Branson, Missouri. In the process, countless lives were lost. Men and women left to die in the dust and sand so that his truth could be better known. It took them a while to realize that it was kind of hard to spread the truth to dead bodies. We cut over to Castle Carillion, where the lord of the castle is currently engaged in a crusade to return a holy shroud of a saint. Lady Carillion receives a visitor, Father Robotail. While he's there seeking permission to celebrate the feast of St. Jude, not that they needed permission, but the people respect their family so much that they see their law as on par with God, but he's really there because of troubling dreams he's been having. Oh yeah, showing up to deliver a sermon completely naked. I get you, Father. He dreams that Lord Carillion will be returning to the castle soon, but that he'll be bringing back a great evil with him. The true origin of Furbies. Said Lord is offering a prayer to God after their victory at a temple of some kind. But when he enters the temple, he just finds a puzzle box. He's distraught over this, and when he returns home to his wife, who wants to cuddle after almost two years away from him, he's still feeling pretty down about the whole thing. You cannot imagine the horrors I endured, the losses I sustained. And for what? A box. A mere ornate box mentioned nowhere in the Gospels, and wholly without value. Not in the Gospels, but doesn't 1 Corinthians 13.13 13 say, And now these three remain, faith, box, and charity, but the greatest of these is box. My Bible might have a misprint. She tries to comfort him and offer an alternate interpretation, but he feels like he's lost and just walks off. Utterly devoted to him, Lady Carillion declares that she'll dedicate herself to finding a solution to this quandary. A year passes, and Carillion's lands and household have fallen into disrepair, while she and Father Robotail study the box, as well as several different religious and satanic texts. For to battle an enemy, one must first know him and his tools. We must study lots of reality television. She discovered what the puzzle box is, but believes its purpose is to summon the devil so that they can smite it. She does this, but the Cenobite that emerges states that he is, of course, not the devil. I do not lie. My packs are far more binding. Behold, my end user license agreement. Also, uh, Cenobite, I think your fishing line might have caught something it shouldn't have. Nearby, Lord Carillion spots that the crucifix has gone upside down, which, by the way, kids, is not a sign of evil. An upside down cross or crucifix is called the Cross of St. Peter. Google it. And runs off to investigate with a sword. It does not go well for him, as the Cenobite summons a bunch of swords to stab him to death. However, the Cenobite elects to take his soul instead of the good ladies, figuring his soul is close enough. Father Robotail does his incantation, and the Cenobite leaves. Later, the lady thinks this was all for naught, and they should depart. But Robotail thinks that was indeed the devil, and that it was his incantation that forced it away. With his encouragement, the two embark on a crusade themselves, punishing women they think are possessed, burning supposed witches, torturing, etc. They get together, and Lady Carillion even becomes pregnant, deciding they need to directly attack Satan again before the child is born. And I will not bear my child into such a wretched world. Instead, I'll risk the mission and my baby's life by doing this before it's born. I'm such a smart person. The Cenobite reappears, wondering which of them he's taking this time. He denies once again being the devil and mocks Father Robotail's faith, especially since holy water and the like don't affect him. There is but one all-pervading knowledge man has, one constant known by one and all. Linkara will never be as popular as the Bee Gees! No, he says it's suffering. And that is my stock, for which you will now trade. The exchange rate is $30 per suffering right now. Father Robotail is crucified on an X-Cross, and the Cenobite tells Lady Carillion it's time to leave. She begs for mercy. Mercy? Yes, I believe the day calls for mercy. I mean, it is Friday. I guess you should get a break. 
He says that one of them can stay, and unleashes the soul of her dead husband on her, still carrying a sword. The story ends with a servant of the house hearing screams and going to investigate. Piety, it has been said, never comes cheaply, so it's best to get it used or refurbished. It is an imperfect world. Its price is often equal parts the good intentions of the righteous and the impurity of the damned. Taxes and other fees may apply. The choice between the two determines the path a soul will walk. Some choices may lead you to attach your lower lip to your nipple. This is not a good path to walk. And we see that what was left behind was the baby, lying next to the puzzle box. The heir of Carillion will walk a dark path indeed. But he'll still be rich, so he won't care. Our next story is Dead Man's Hand, and it's difficult for me to go into much detail, because it's mostly just a game of cards. It's the Old West, and a mysterious stranger comes to a saloon seeking out a particular man, Jed Lawson. The stranger makes a bet on a single hand of poker. If the stranger wins, he gets everything Jed owns. If Jed wins, he gets the most valuable thing on Earth putting the lament configuration on the table. We see that Jed has his bad moments and his good moments as the cards are dealt, but ultimately Jed wins with two pair. The lament configuration moves around on its own as Jed wins, and the stranger says Jed won and just takes the box away, proclaiming, I said I would give you the most valuable thing on earth, and so I shall, by taking this with me. And he just leaves! That's it! Everyone decides to go to church that Sunday after watching the game, sensing that something horrible could have happened, but otherwise, nothing bad happens. The hell was the point of that? Did the comic run out of budget to show some damn Cenobites? Don't get me wrong, it's an unexpected twist and probably one of the happiest endings to ever show up in any Hellraiser story, but it's just weird, especially for the first issue. It's even hard for me to riff on, there's so little material. Although, there is this line. The missus swears she could see inside that box the stranger brought. Says all kinds of ungodly creatures was waiting in there. So Cenobites are just Lego man sized until someone opens the box? No wonder they're so messed up if they keep getting tossed around inside the thing. Our next story, The Warm Red, is definitely better off. A woman named Maureen is getting in on a deal to sell a bunch of land that's going to be used for an amusement park. All she has to do is convince the owner of the one farm on it, a man named Brian Rhodes, to sell. She arrives at the farmhouse, where he greets her. What do you want? Did I say greets? I meant tells her to piss off. Brian has a puzzle box in his mantelpiece, and she idly plays with it as they talk. And we see flashbacks to someone, a woman at that, being bound by rope and the narration informing us of how attracted Brian is to Maureen. The conversation goes in the expected direction. She tries to take advantage of him being alone and kind of naive about women, trying to seduce him while underselling the worth of his land, but still wanting to buy it off of him. And he drugs her lemonade so she passes out while topless, meaning I have to censor the rest of the story. I said you should leave. I said you should. Lemonade's been doing that for a month now, can't figure it out. Really should stop offering it to people, but damn my southern hospitality. She's tied to a very bloody bed in the guy's house, and reveals that he cuts himself whenever he's attracted to women. A practice his mother started him on, because Brian is a messed up kind of guy. However, he is not going to torture her alone. He uses the lament configuration to summon a Cenobite. Specifically, Face, whom we last saw in the Hellraiser Dark Holiday special. Well now it's just weird to see the demon who has a face stapled over his own outside of Christmas. This is his first appearance in the series, one of the few recurring Cenobites in the entire thing. Face describes being summoned to Earth. The dissolution of my own flesh delights me. The chaos of cellular agitation, the cacophony of life, is replaced with the pure mathematical orbits of electrons, the harmony of crystal, the sweet music of the subatomic spheres. Pity the smell doesn't match that. It's like I'm always appearing in Brian's outhouse. Face is a bit irritated with Brian, since it's been a while since he summoned him, and that he knows that he's passed up opportunities to summon him before. However, before Brian can make the first cut, Maureen speaks up and offers Face a deal. Face is intrigued and hears her out. Brian's a loser who lives far away from people and keeps to himself, 
But in two years, with the amusement park, it'll be swarming with people. So she'll offer up as many as she can to him if he wants. Shut up! Shut up! Or I'll... 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 You'll what? Kill me? Oof, don't tempt him, Maureen. Guy like this, he'll probably make you read his screenplay. She said that Brian is weak while she has ambitions and plans and can deliver on what he needs. And Face is intrigued. He turns on Brian, but doesn't kill him. As he points out, Maureen could just be lying to save her own skin and can't deliver, so he's got an idea. Putting Brian in her position. For Brian, it would be a return to his childhood. For me, a diversion. For her, it's a test. For the maid, a very difficult cleanup job. And it seems she passes her test, as he instructs her to mutilate him and to use her imagination. And with a grin, she decides what she'll do, ending the tale. After a bizarre single page of art featuring two guys, one with a smile drawn over their hand covering their mouth... The hell you cut back to me for? I don't know what's going on with it. We have our final story, Dance of the Fetus. Just making a guess here, I'm thinking the Macarena. It's a weird one. A woman named Alice buys some meat from the butcher. There's silence for a few pages as she walks home in the rain with her groceries, walks up the stairs where she thinks she sees a demon or a cenobite, but then it vanishes. Another false impression. How much longer must I wait? God, I solved the lament configuration like three days ago. Get with the hooks and chains already, dang it! When she enters her apartment, she spots some kind of weird hunchbacked Cenobite. Though, given the art style, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be hunchbacked or not. Waiting for her on her kitchen counter, having eaten some of her food. It apologizes for being late, saying they were backed up. I've run this exact scene in my head so many times, I thought I'd know how to react when the time came. After the 210th time, I knew you were serious. I mean, most people call it quits on opening the box at 209. You're something special. He wants to know what made her want all this, and she just shrugs, not certain. And in a trippy sequence, he leaps into her mouth, she swallows him, then goes to sit in the bathtub with the panels showing us a straight razor and the occasional drop of blood falling. Starting to feel like explorers in the further regions of experience with just false advertising. Inside of her body, the Cenobite... I don't know, attacks her nerve endings? It's not exactly clear. However, the deeper it goes, it discovers a fetus. It asks the fetus if Alice is aware of it, and of course, the fetus has no idea what he's talking about. This just won't do. There are regulations. I mean, what would it be like if we could just take anyone? You have to want to go. So that Cenobite in the first story wasn't being merciful, he was just following the damn protocol. What a tool. But yeah, the fetus has no idea what the hell he's talking about, or what hell even is, so he says that the fetus can't stay with her. No, we're not that cruel. I mean, one of our number has been helping a dude in the country torture and mutilate people who otherwise had nothing to do with summoning us, but we're not assholes! So yeah, he exits out of Alice, through her mouth, and tosses the fetus spirit, for lack of a better term, out of there. He tells it to leave, that he doesn't make the rules, and Alice seems to die, and so our comic ends with the fetus floating into the sky and transforming into a star? So it quite literally became a star baby? Was this the monolith Cenobite? But yeah! That's it! We get an afterword that teases future stories, another kind of nonsensical art piece, and that's it for the first issue! This comic is a mixed bag. As with any anthology, each story needs to be evaluated individually. The Canons of Pain is alright for the most part. It demonstrates for the purposes of the anthology that these stories can take place anytime, anywhere, and show off some pretty cool artwork. It's a bit weaker in the sense that it doesn't really draw the parallels I think it was trying to with humans torturing in the name of religion versus torture in the name of the Cenobite's own purpose, but it's got some decent gore and is definitely putting forth some effort, and I like the twisted ending both of Mercy and in her husband delivering the blow. Dead Man's Hand, while having some great artistic layouts, particularly showing the cards being dealt, is really, really pointless. There's no gore, no Cenobites, nothing particularly interesting. Dude walks in with a puzzle box, puzzle box never opens. 
I don't get what they were trying to say with it. And you can do interesting stories that speak to the human condition or character development while doing something mundane like a game of cards. Twilight Zone has done it at least twice to great effect. But this, this was nothing. The Warm Red was very good, what I would expect out of a Hellraiser comic. A Cenobite, interesting plot developments, maybe even a human making a deal with them and showing how depraved they can be right back at the Cenobites. The art's not my favorite, but it's decent enough. Dance of the Fetus is just... confusing. There's long stretches of nothing happening, no exposition about what the deal with the Cenobites was or why she was waiting for so long or anything like that. I enjoyed the angle that they had rules. They couldn't bring the fetus along because it didn't have a choice like Alice did. But what the hell that all meant is bizarre, not helped by the very stylized artwork that at times was unclear about what was occurring. It just wasted a lot of time on minutia instead of getting to the point, and it never really did. Although, not sure what I'm supposed to take with how the comic was bookended by two stories ending with unborn children being left behind by the Cenobites. Next time, we've seen Cenobites during the holidays and gotten a taste of the regular book, so let's give one last hurrah to the season that's gone with the Hellraiser Summer Special. Hello and welcome back to A Shock the Fourth Wall! So there's already a holiday special for Hellraiser. What's another time period that really doesn't feel like it should have anything specifically to do with the Cenobites? Ooh, summer! How'd that guy get in there? But yeah, Hellraiser Summer Special. You know, it's funny. I'm probably going to get more hate for using that terrible, terrible song in that montage than I will for the fact that I put it together with all those gore scenes. Anyway, yeah, I don't know how these things got made. I don't understand what went through their minds for this. And the one we'll be looking at next week. It's just... Bizarre to me. Instead, let me take this opportunity to do a quick rundown on my thoughts on all the individual Hellraiser movies, in case you're curious. Classic. Obviously a classic. I don't know how you could be a fan of this franchise and not like the original. It's just damn good, and even with all the stellar performances, gotta love Andrew Robinson, aka Garrick from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Also damn good. There are a few little things I dislike, but it expands the story, dips even farther into the horrific, and just feels like a good sequel that some would argue is better than the original. Ugh, gave my thoughts on the review of the comic. It's just... not good. Underrated. Many decry it as Hellraiser in space, but really the space thing is just a framing device, telling a story over the course of many generations. It's nowhere near perfect, and it's still got some issues, but I can't hate it, especially for providing one of the best pinhead lines of the franchise. For God's sake, do I look like someone who cares what God thinks? The first of the direct-to-video sequels that just took another script and slapped Hellraiser on it. And honestly, I think it's still pretty good. I get major Silent Hill vibes from it. And for direct-to-video, the effects are not terrible at all. This one's okay. It's got some good ideas, and it's great to see the return of Kirsty, but the effects are not as well executed, and it feels a bit repetitive at times. Yeah, mixed bag. There are some good ideas, definitely stuff that's horrific, but the plot is kind of all over the place, and Pinhead is the only redeeming factor. Awful. Just awful. Watch Phalus or Dina's reviews for more details, but just terrible in every regard. The first in a while that's actually written to be a Hellraiser movie... And it's atrocious. It's also the first without Doug Bradley as Pinhead, and the two guys they have playing him, one for his voice and the other the physical body, both suck. The voice isn't deep or commanding enough, the kid they've got playing Pinhead looks confused and bored, and we keep cutting to him standing around doing nothing. 
Remember my joke last week about the Cenobites being Lego Man sized until the box is opened? Yeah, that seems to be the case here, as often those cutaways to Pinhead seem to imply that he's just inside the box and listening in on the people outside of it. Speaking of, yeah, the plot is bad, mostly taking place in a single house with uninteresting characters and family drama that goes nowhere. A few good ideas, but arguably it is the worst Hellraiser movie by far. Severely underrated. I actually really like this one. The guy doing Pinhead in this one is a massive improvement, possessing both the regal dignity of Pinhead while having a voice that commands attention. The plot isn't anything that special, but the characters are a lot more interesting, as well as expanding the mythology for the first time in a long while, with another order of demons who are a bit grosser, but the auditor is a delight, and I would love to see him return in another Hellraiser movie. So with that out of the way, let's dig into to Clive Barker's Hellraiser Summer Special and enjoy some fun in the sun! And hooks and chains, can't forget those. Cover is a bit icky. Lots of hooks in a person's face stretching it everywhere. I mean, it's kind of cartoonish how far it goes, to the point where even their hair is being pulled every which way. But I can understand why this might make people squirm a bit. Also, it doesn't really scream summer. Do you have sunburn? Boy, do I have an unconventional treatment for you. What I did on my summer vacation. Oh god, it's the Tandy Computer Whiz Kids! They were Cenobites this whole time! And the TRS-80 was their puzzle box! Oh no! Like the holiday special, it's an anthology comic, but with a framing story surrounding it. And thus we begin that framing story, The Lesson, where we see a woman running and screaming in a Catholic school. Sister Mary Frances knew she was going to hell. She just didn't think it'd be so soon. She didn't think the department transfer papers would be processed so quickly. She knew as soon as she caught her eye wandering over the cover of Stud Boy magazine while shopping for, um, feminine hygiene products at the Five and Dime. Not for the porno mag, of course. It just turns out that God hates tampons. So when the devils took her hair, she felt she was getting just what she deserved. Well, good news, sister. You're not going to hell. You just have to be bald. Honestly, I think that's a pretty good trade-off for not being damned for all eternity. The narrator is Father Parody, taking bets on whether that name was deliberate or not, who is explaining this to the new teacher, Miss Neal, who needs to take over for Sister Mary Frances' class. He bemoans the kids, claiming they're little devils, while Miss Neal is more understanding of them having to get readjusted again after summer vacation. What's more, he claims they're responsible for destroying Sister Mary Frances' wig. It's not the Inquisition, Father. At that moment, Pinhead leaps out and proclaims, No one escapes the Cenobite Inquisition! He grumbles about how she's just a substitute teacher, but she shoes him off so she can talk to the kids directly, hoping to get the truth out of them without being a colossal asshat. She makes a joke about him to the kids, and they get a good laugh. Wanting to learn more, she goes up to a kid who has a bunch of drawings all over him. Let's start with you. Joey, right? I've heard all about your top percentage Rattata. Since Joey seems shy, she invites him to talk about his summer vacation. And thus he begins his story, Baby Cakes, which begins with a woman chained up in some kind of surgical operating room with a bunch of cables hooked up to her. Nine months. Nine months of whiteness and loneliness and feeling the child grow inside her. And yet still not the worst HMO she's had to deal with. We learned that this woman wanted a baby, but she was barren. Adoption agencies rejected her for being a single parent, and even the black market turned her away because she didn't have the money for one. But there was still one place she hadn't tried. Hell. This is a weird remake of Rosemary's Baby. We see that she has a lament configuration. She knew of the Cenobites, knew what they could do, what they were capable of. Their advertising campaign on TV and radio had worked. They had taken children. Perhaps they could give her one. And these first two examples are of them not taking children. Seriously, both of these are from the issue we looked at last week, where they outright refuse to take babies from pregnant women. Anyway, even if they can't just give her a baby, maybe she could have some rockin' sex with a Cenobite. They seem like the best people for this. The Cenobite who shows up is... 
practically normal compared to most we've seen. He's just got some weird piercings on his forehead and spiky armor, which she seems only too happy to rub up against. Mind your face, lady. Her grinding up against him makes it clear what she wants. Many experiences are possible. What exactly do you want? I want a child. Whoa, lady! I'm from hell, and even we are not that messed up. Now, of course, she wants to become impregnated, and he agrees to help her get many children. However, when she lays back to start, she suddenly finds herself in the surgical room we saw at the start, waiting there for nine months as the baby develops. She's artificially inseminated, which is really weird for the Cenobites, since their entire deal is extreme sex. Although, I don't know, maybe it's just this dude's kink. After nine months, the baby is born, but she's horrified to find the markings all over his body. Said markings actually indicate places where the baby can be folded and twisted. It is indeed an extraordinary child. It is a Cenobite, but it is also a lament configuration. All rolled up in one tidy package. If you boop its nose, it opens up a portal for the engineer! Don't ask what happens when it needs to pee. Properly handled, your children will open the doorway to a new realm in hell. Improperly handled, and they will open a doorway to the janitor's closet. And so the story ends as another demon prepares to impregnate her again and again. The woman forever trapped to be a birthing machine for these kids. And that's what Joey seems to be, one of the Cenobite Lament Configuration babies. Did you like it? It was fine, Joey, but I asked what you did on your summer vacation. Were you only born last month or something? Miss Neal is, of course, disturbed by this. Like can mean so many things to so many people. Like, if you didn't know better, you'd say my puzzle was a phallic symbol. The boner configuration. Miss Neal asks about Sister Mary Frances' wig, but no one wants to talk about that. A girl named Anne wants to talk about her summer vacation. Beginning the story, The Devil's Absolution. This one is in the summer of 1966 near Marseille, France. At a villa, members of a crime family are meeting. First, we'll drink a pasty saldo, then we'll talk. Whatever you say, meme! Okay, I'm sure it's actually supposed to be pronounced like meme or something here, but I can't help but think this guy is supposed to be like that stock photo of the dude checking out another woman while his girlfriend is pissed. Meme is angry that Aldo has been selling drugs inside of France against his orders. The family needs to move with the times, Meme. Your conscience is out of date. It expired two weeks ago, and you still haven't gone to get a new one. When he persists in insulting Meme, he and his goons just shoot Aldo and dump his body over the cliffs. Annie was nearby hearing all this, singing Alouette, and it seems she's Meme's granddaughter. We cut to 26 years later in Malibu, where Annie is all grown up and attending a party. Okay, now I really have to question whether or not this happened during Annie's summer vacation. After the main party is over, a Texan woman named Bambi is brought out to an after party. That consists of them using a puzzle box to summon a Cenobite. I summon thee, O worm face. Thy call is answered. Where is thy gift? Make it quick! Half of my face is being used as bait for my weekend fishing trip with Pinhead! Wormface plucks off the woman's head. And they also stab her for some reason. And back over at the Mafia house, Meme is being dragged out of retirement for some advice. Business ain't the same these days. Full of punks that ain't got no honor. Even Nazis again. Nazis? <laughs> Man, can you imagine if the Nazis came back? <laughs> oh god, we live in hell. Meme laments that back in their day, they still knew the difference between good and evil. We did what we had to to survive. And what we had to do to get the palatial mansion, but I'm pretty sure we needed that to survive. He informs Meme of how Annie seems to be involved with some very bad people and wants to fix things, but Meme says that since this is family business, only one of the family can fix it. So he elects to head there and straighten things out. At another party, it's Annie's turn to be the sacrifice, much to her shock. But as they summon Wormface, Meme shows up with a gun and starts shooting the partygoers. One of them tries to get Wormface to intervene, but of course he just stands there. Do you think he cares? Imbeciles. To him, you're pigs. Meat animals. 
just like the Nazis. The Nazis were meat animals to the Cenobites? Meme informs Wormface that he knows what it is and isn't frightened, insisting on taking Annie back with him. My granddaughter, she doesn't belong with you. But she does. My worms have tasted her soul. It tasted of grape jelly and mustard. Wormface is strangely unperturbed and cooperative about this whole thing, though only objects when Meme insists on taking the puzzle box as well. And he repels Wormface by shooting at him? Wait, so guns could take out Cenobites this whole time? No wonder they needed Atkins. They had to level the playing field. After they return to France, Meme asks Annie why she engaged in all these terrible things, that it could damage her soul. She reminds him that he's a murderer, and she's been surrounded by his murdering since she was a little girl. It's a brief bit, but it's a lot of character stuff condensed into it, with Meme defending himself by claiming that he's made atonement and that the priest has absolved him of his sins. See, that means his murders are A-OK! -okay. Don't worry about it. After several nights where Annie has nightmares about what happened, Meme realizes he can only resolve this himself, contacting Wormface again. He agrees to go with him if this will relieve her of the nightmares. Maybe an absolution from hell will succeed where the church has failed. I'm not Catholic, but I am pretty sure that's not how that works, dude. He recognizes that his wickedness was the true source of her pain, and now that he's gone, she might be free of it. Perhaps, but for you, nothing exists but a gulf of fathomless despair. You shall let Leviathan's glory set your heart afire. You shall learn the true delight that cannot rot. Paintball night on Thursdays! Credit where it's due, he's defiant to the end. Wormface says he'll obey, and his last words alive are... I will not. You gonna be the worm face! After Annie laments his loss, we cut back to the classroom. Annie has made a cat's cradle, though she says it's a spider's web, and Miss Neal writes up a letter for her parents. Between your stories and, uh, associations, I really think we need to schedule a parent-teacher conference. I mean, you're either a 25-year-old woman or you're the granddaughter of a mafia boss. Neither option is that great for your continued education here. Why don't we try someone a little less eager this time, hmm? Maybe then teacher can keep her lunch down, hmm? Wow, you've got a really weak stomach if that last story was that bad for you. Or did Annie go into detail about Wormface's... well... face? She asks Ernesto for the next summer vacation story, as he's just moved to the area from Central America. And thus he begins his story... For My Son, which takes place in the South Bronx in New York City. Okay, in the past, I have demonstrated that I suck at geography, but please don't tell me that I have been wrong this whole time and New York City is actually located in Central America. Actually, it's a story told from the perspective of Ernesto's father. He and Ernesto had moved to New York from El Salvador, where he is certain they would have died had they stayed due to a dictator murdering people. But now they're dealing with extreme poverty and are going hungry. Ernesto's mother is already dead, and the father has to work in a sweatshop sewing clothes. Naturally, nothing about this situation is good. If immigration finds out about him, they'll be sent to their deaths, they make $2 an hour, and as demonstrated when one worker severely injures her hand on one of the machines, the people running the sweatshop do not give two craps about the workers, threatening to call immigration on them if they talk about the conditions, and docking the father's pay for using some of the fabric to wrap up the bleeding hand. And it's stories like this one that remind you that compared to some of the worst of humanity, the Cenobites are amateurs at the art of making people suffer. But yeah, it kind of sucks for the two right now. Not made any easier when the next day the sweatshop is raided by immigration officials. His asshole boss points out Ernesto's father in particular and he panics, running off even though there's no real sign that they're chasing him. He runs down into the subway past the fare machines and just keeps running, especially when he thinks the police are being called due to him tripping and the running and the beating the fare and etc. He runs into a woman and baby that fall onto the tracks and, well... Yeah, they're killed by an oncoming train. He even jumps the tracks himself after it passes, though he spots a train coming, but then suddenly finds himself in a strange doorway. When he enters into it, it's pitch black, with only some of his matches to light the way. As he starts navigating the dark tunnels, even finding an oil lantern, he reasons that he'll have to go to prison to atone for the people he accidentally killed. Though thinks that'd be for the best, Ernesto would be placed with a foster family. On the ground, he finds a subway map. Though all the paths lead back to a diamond shape in the center. 
aka Leviathan, the god of the Cenobites from Hellraiser 2. As a reminder, the epic comic series expanded on the mythology a bit and frequently invoked Leviathan. But yeah, he's not giving up on escaping the tunnel. I can do this. I can find my way out. This is no more than a puzzle. A game! Unfortunately, it turned out to be a collectible card game. We cut to a year later. The father continues to narrate, talking about how Ernesto has found a new home. In fact, Ernesto goes to visit his father's old sweatshop boss to commission some jackets to be made with a certain diamond shape on the back. He instructs the owner to create the pattern himself and pays very well for quality work of the recreation of said pattern implying that there's drug money behind this. However, as he contemplates turning in the drug runners to give himself a lighter sentence for his impending charges for the sweatshop, he completes the design, and is met by a rather inhuman-looking Cenobite that stretches his body into... well, that. And he's still alive. Also, is it just me, or does the Cenobite somewhat resemble a sewing machine? But yeah, this is the ultimate fate of Ernesto's father, a Cenobite in Leviathan's service the payment for solving the puzzle of the subway tunnels. As I mentioned during the review of the holiday special, the ongoing series introduced some new puzzles that could summon the Cenobites. And sometimes the puzzles were like the ones seen here, more like traveling down a specific pathway or making a design. Although I feel like there should be some more warning labels about which ones get your flesh stretched and which ones give you a job offer. Sorry if that one was more summarization than joke-telling, it's just it's surprisingly long and kind of depressing, especially in light of real-world stuff going on at the time of this video's creation. However, since this is also supposed to be a comedy show, here's David Spade and Pinhead again. Do you have the new Cosmo? That is the new one. The one with Cindy Crawford. Back in the classroom, Ernesto says his father would say it's hot as hell, but Miss Neal interrupts before he finishes. That's quite all right. I can guess the place your father would use as a comparison. Yeah, not comparison. We've got a typo there. There are also some typos in Annie's story, using the wrong spelling of her name within it. Nothing too pervasive, just something I noticed. Anyway, after spotting a graphic jigsaw puzzle amongst their toys, Miss Neal has started to lose her patience with the kids, especially since they're not closer to figuring out where Sister Mary Francis's hair is. One of the girls, Tina, gets upset when she threatens to bring Father Parody back in, and she apologizes for losing her temper. I scared you, didn't I? Uh-huh, scared me. And Sister Mary Francis taught us, do unto others. So let me tell you about Marvel, Miss Neal. And thus we head to our final story, Old Wives' Tale, the direct-to-video sequel of The First Wives Club. Cenobites are surprisingly still involved. It's New York again, where a bunch of kids are playing on a playground, with Tina in particular playing hopscotch and singing about stepping on a crack and breaking your mother's back. However, after she actually steps on a crack, she learns that her mother did indeed break her back falling down a long flight of stairs, and vows never to play the game again, nor did she even play with her friends anymore. Instead, she spent her recess fiddling with a strange puzzle. Why would there be filler text in the middle of the Shakespeare puzzle? What, are we supposed to assume the first two lines of this one are King Lear, and the two after are Macbeth? The other volumes take up four lines each, so why would these be just two? Tina didn't talk to anyone. She wouldn't even eat lunch. All she wanted to do was play with her box. Hey, phrasing! Her teacher, Evelyn Wong, tries to intervene and convince her that what happened to her mother was not her fault. She mentions how, as a child, she used to believe that there were monsters under her bed, but it was just her imagination. She offers to hold on to the lament configuration she's been playing with and give it back when she's ready for it. Tina making her promise to take care of it. Make sure you take care of it, Miss Wong. I need it back. Me and Chatterer are supposed to have dinner tonight. I'm gonna give him a makeover. That evening, Miss Wong stays behind in her classroom to grade papers and plan tomorrow's workload when a woman barges in with crazy eyes screaming at her that she's teaching lies to her students. You know, a common thing that happens at public schools. She doesn't say who she is, simply telling her that the monsters under her bed were real, proving that she knows what she's talking about by knowing the name Miss Wong gave to one of the creatures. She says that Miss Wong should come with her to St. Mark's Hospital. I know lots of things, and I want to show you, prove to you that the old stories are true! You can get Mew from under the truck! I believe! 
Assuming that she's an escaped mental patient, Miss Wong humors her and follows her as she continues. You see, Miss Wong, there's a reason the old stories are still around. They were created by the Cenobites as a way of establishing order. It was felt that the best way to run an orderly universe is to reach people when they're young. Wouldn't it be more convincing if the Cenobites showed up in the middle of, like, Times Square or something and said, Hey, run an orderly society or we'll tear your soul apart. That's why I'm not really that enthusiastic about the retcons made to the Cenobites in the epic comic stuff. It's not bad, not at all, and produces some excellent stories, but the original idea of the Cenobites was about a group of neutral creatures, not necessarily demons, that just had gone so far in their pursuit of hedonistic pleasures that self-mutilation, and mutilating others, was the only way for them to feel anything anymore. Subsequently, why they could no longer distinguish between pain and pleasure. In the movies, they just became demons of punishment and wanting to do evil for evil's sake. It doesn't make the movies bad. As I said, I quite enjoy most of the Hellraiser sequels. It just feels like they took something that was unique and interesting and made them less unique and interesting. And that's the same for the comics, where their new purpose is as demon servants of Leviathan, who wish to spread order in all things. Again, it's not a terrible thing, and they do some fascinating stuff with it, but it's still just making them garden-variety demons, and you start scratching your head when you think about the whole order thing, and wonder what aspect of order involves attaching your lower lip to your nipple or having worms for a face. And frankly, their method of facilitating order seems disorderly and too small a scale by utilizing the puzzles. I don't know, maybe I'm talking out of my ass here. It's just a thing that kind of bugs me. Children are very trusting, Miss Wong. They tend to believe anything they're told, especially what they're told by their parents, or teachers, or YouTubers. The old stories have been passed down through the ages. That's why you heard the same stories your parents did. And why children are still hearing them today. Are they though? How many of those kids know the sacrifices of Bob Corby, dammit? Entering the hospital, Miss Wong realizes how empty it is. The woman leading her to a special wing. Ah yes, here we are. The wing of the children who didn't believe. When someone did got your nose, they didn't really think that their nose had been got. Now, who oh boy, this is something. It's a collection of children who have been mutilated for... Well, here are the reasons. Here is Tommy, who found out what happens when you sit too close to the TV set. This is Steven, who learned that if you touch yourself too often, your palms will grow hair and you'll go blind. Next we have Bruce, who found out that if you keep making faces, your face will become stuck like that. Wow. That is remarkably stupid. Where do I even start with that? Like, medically, socially. Yes, I know, this is the series featuring evil hellish puzzle boxes containing demons that torture and mutilate. But that is just... Dumb. Then there's David, who just found that if you die in your dreams, you die in real life. That's just because Freddy Krueger got to him, you asshole. That's why he was in the montage at the beginning. Finally, we have Jack, who crossed his heart and hoped to die. So somebody stuck a needle in his eye. That seems more like the problem of whatever psychopath jabbed the needles into his eye and less about the old stories, lady. What kind of hospital is this? These children need help. I'm gonna get a doctor. Don't worry, we've already called in a doctor to fix this mess and sort out the idiots who diagnosed these kids. I would make him apologize personally, but I'm having him spend the rest of the day checking that countertop's heartbeat. The woman starts transforming into a bizarre creature, saying that the old wives' tales are a way of instilling order in the minds of the young, of structure in their lives, a form of propaganda to make their minds think a certain way. No one is coming to help these children! They are beyond help! Yeah, I'm deferring to the other doctor's assessment. Keith! I think Mr. Countertop would really appreciate your undivided attention. But yeah, this nightmare thing says that it's a guardian for the puzzle box and demands Miss Wong give it back to Tina. 
With the creature threatening to return the monsters from under her bed, Miss Wong goes and does just that, telling Tina and the other kids that the tales are true, that fear of things like stepping on a crack gives them structure and keeps us all in line. So they need to keep the tales and fear alive. That's right, keep those kids good and afraid, Miss Wong. He wouldn't want them to try to defeat the hellish monsters threatening them. Back to the classroom. And that's what I did on my summer vacation. That was during the school year! And don't tell me it was summer school or some crap like that. That's not summer vacation then! For some reason, Tina has morphed the lament configuration she was playing with into the Leviathan diamond shape from Hellbound, and Miss Neal is at the end of her rope, wondering what the hell has gotten into these kids. And we see that above the kids' heads at the ceiling is a small Cenobite creature that's holding the missing wig. The kids say that nothing has gotten into them, but rather a hell is where they got into. And so our comic ends with the kids saying they tried to show Sister Mary Frances where they went, but her hair came off but they'll show Miss Neal instead. And the Cenobite creature lowers down some kind of bladed contraption towards her head. By the time this thing is done, everyone in this school will be bald! Anyway, again, anthology, so needs to be judged individually for each story, but if we judge it as a summer special, it sucks. Although, individually, the stories are overall pretty good. The weakest, in my opinion, is Old Wives' Tale. Not because of the concept of telling children lies and superstitions to force them to order their minds a certain way, but in the execution of it. Larger myths and fairy tales I get. Using basic stuff like cross my heart, hope to die, or step on a crack, break my mother's back, is just idiotic and demonstrably false in every way. Hell, just based on the fact that the monsters under Miss Wong's bed eventually went away means that their whole, ooh, it's all real thing is bullcrap, since why would you ever have them go away? Of course adults growing up will tell them it's not real unless you keep the threat present. The idea of it has some merit, but the things the writer chose to use for it were a bad call. The Devil's Absolution was good, though the artwork was a bit muddy. Same goes for To My Son. Baby Kicks had the best art in my opinion, and definitely the most straightforward Hellraiser-style story, though the other ones, while unconventional, still work within the universe, so I have no problem there. My issue stems from them calling this a summer special, and having the framing story be them talking about what they did on their summer vacation, when none of them talk about what they did on their summer vacations! There's nothing summary about any of this, and despite these stories supposedly being told by the kids, we have radically different narrators, time jumps, and perspectives framing them. So if the kids are telling the stories, how is that even working? Like, did Ernesto say, Now I'm my father, and I wanted to make sure me and my son don't die in El Salvador, so we move to the Bronx? The big joke everyone was making when I announced this episode, including Dr. Crafty in the title card, was that this would be, like, a Hellraiser swimsuit issue. But no, the summer vacation idea in the framing story was the only thing making this in any way related to the summer. And they still screwed that up! This is really no different than any other regular issue of the ongoing series. Change the names of the characters, and you could slap any of the other Hellraiser stories from the anthology in there, and it would have made no difference. I mean, I suppose you could say, well, it's just because it came out in the summer. But then why have the summer vacation framing device at all, and not just have the kids tell Miss Neal their own life stories or something? Or just call it a Hellraiser special without attaching the season to it. Like I said, the individual stories are fine, arguably quite good, but I take a bit of umbrage at the bait and switch with the title. Next time, we have one last Hellraiser seasonal special to haunt us, as we turn the clock back a bit more to the Hellraiser Spring Slaughter. Hello and welcome back to A Shock the Fourth Wall! Didn't I used to get these videos out on Monday? I've never released videos on Monday. Anyway, we're closing out this year's Hellraiser comics with something a bit different than the other two.
Unlike the other two comics I reviewed this year, this one is not an anthology. Yeah, this one's a complete story for 48 pages. Aside from some miniseries Epic did with the franchise, that was actually not a thing they did, so it's kind of a real surprise that this is what they decided to do. Mind you, like last week's summer special, this still has nothing to do with spring, so the title is meaningless. Let's dig into Clive Barker's Hellraiser Spring Slaughter and see what its deal is instead. Surprisingly, this cover actually works a lot better if it had been used for the summer special. Recall that all of you thought we were in for some kind of Hellraiser swimsuit issue, and instead we got that skin-stretching machine from Star Trek Insurrection. Here, though? Check out Hex Vision Lady here with her Lament Configuration-themed thong. Spring is the time to put demon summoning devices on your naughty bits. Also, a bunch of cool-looking monsters, including this thing up front with snake tongues. Tremors 7 is going in a weird direction, guys. It's not a bad cover, but once again, I question its relation to the spring slaughter idea. Also, there is no Lament Configuration bikini in this comic, 0 out of 10. The actual title of the story is Raising Hell, which, as we'll see, is a neat little play on words given the homophone with raising. We open in Hell, of course, in the realm of Leviathan, the diamond-shaped god of the Cenobites that spews out black light. Behold the realm of the perpetual rave! It never rests, set to its task, turning like a millstone, wet with blood, greased with fat, crushing flesh, grinding bone and gristle. But enough about Denny's. However, Leviathan's light suddenly dies out. For one excruciating instant, frozen, still and silent, as Leviathan suddenly stops. Suddenly, a Cenobite version of the Energizer Bunny rolls in, shakes its head, and moves on. Leviathan transforms into a Lament configuration, something that had also happened at the end of Hellraiser 2, but I guess it doing it this time is really bad for Hell. It also screams in pain as it does so, which is an opening that one of the tormented souls of Leviathan has apparently been waiting for. Oh, and in this little scene of torture, you'll notice two naked ladies up top, probably hanging from hooks or something. Yeah, people were thinking I forgot to censor a bit in the Hellraiser number 1 review... No, I didn't miss that. That was a deliberate choice. I figured the shot would be fine as long as we weren't actually seeing what was between her legs. But people are right that I probably should have played it safe and censored that, so I'm doing it here. Anyway, the old man being tortured grabs a nearby lament configuration and makes a run for it, taking advantage of all the demons of hell being in pain from Leviathan's cry to try to escape. Think, Isidore. Think, old man. It's simple, just a toy, a game. Unfortunately, said game turned out to be buggy and full of microtransactions. He manages to solve the puzzle as a cool-looking monster thing approaches, sending out barbed tendrils to recapture him. With the puzzle solved, he suddenly teleports into a room at the Rayin... Rayin... Reagan Sanitarium and Psychiatric Asylum. And apparently he showed up at the maternity ward of said asylum because those look like a hell of a lot of friggin' cribs and babies. You know, few people talk about Arkham Asylum's baby division. I mean, it's got to exist. Who else is Bat Baby supposed to fight? And thus we have our first part of Raising Hell, Stolen Time. Strangely, stealing time is only a misdemeanor in most states. The man claims to be Isidore Klauski, which the hospital rejects because that would mean he's 160 years old. The strange appearance in the hospital got some local media attention, which in turn attracted some people to the hospital who want to see him. However, the attending nurse refuses to let this man, Mr. Lee, go to see him. He cannot be released until he has been properly examined, but if it were up to me, anyone who would pull a stunt like he did should be kept here for good. Okay, even if he was somehow just pulling an elaborate prank with how he appeared out of nowhere covered in blood, how the hell does that justify locking him up in an asylum? Some mental health professional you are, lady. She tells them to leave. Nurse Bratchett, do you like puzzles? No, not in the least. That's too bad. I was going to leave one of those little marble puzzles that had $50 inside of it that you can get if you solve it, but apparently you don't want it. Mr. Lee meets up with two other figures outside of the asylum, a nun and a priest. The three all know who Isidore is and hope that he can help them. The priest even pulls out a gun. 
A 45 with a silencer. Standard issue with the collar these days. Yeah, ever since the Pope watched Boondock Saints on a whim, things have been weird. None of us is who we once were. Believe it or not, I used to be Wallace Shawn. In the asylum, Isidore is in a padded cell, relaxing. For all of 10 seconds before he notices something outside the door. Some kind of demon that launches a harpoon or something out of the back of its wrist through the window to grab hold of him by the leg. He yells out for help, but no one seems to be coming. If it's trying to pull him, it does a piss poor job of it. Since he's also in a straitjacket, he can't use his hands, so instead he bites down on his tongue and recalls a mystical sigil, painting that symbol on a wall in his own blood with his tongue. A symbol, a talisman, a temporary reprieve. Although the pain and taste on his tongue will not feel temporary. Nurse Bratchett, meanwhile, is preparing to have sex with a guy who works at the asylum, but suddenly feels like she should check on Isidore. What? Christ, Martha, I only got a minute. I should be on duty. Not a good sign if he knew it would only take him a minute. Discovering that the door to Isidore's room has been busted open, Bratchett tells the other guy to call the police. And I just noticed that she apparently never bothered to put all her clothes back on before going out to check. Good job, clearly this place is staffed by professionals. Anyway, before he can do so, our entourage has entered and stops him from calling the cops. They grab Isidore and make their escape, not helped by the fact that the creature that attacked him is still out there and we get a good look at it. Some kind of weird, thin thing that's very bumpy. And I guess that protection sigil encouraged it to go climb a tree. Isidore says that this creature can only take one person back at a time, so one of them is likely going with it. Apparently the asylum is right next to a cemetery. Gotta be great for patient morale. And they dash through it as they make their escape. Like ghosts, flashing in and out of sight, they weave between crosses of granite and tablets of marble. Here, they all think of death of dropping to their knees and clawing open their wrists or stuffing a gun barrel into their mouths. Mostly because, despite being 160 years old and 90 pounds soaking wet, Isidore is surprisingly heavy and they're all out of shape. Why hadn't they done it already? Why weren't they buried deep, rotting beneath some carved stone? Then they remembered that all their wills stipulated for them to be cremated and their ashes shot up into space, so that's probably why. One of their number, Mr. McNoname, is grabbed by the creature with its harpoon thing and pulled back, begging the others to kill him, but they just keep on running. They flee more quickly now, faces of stone and sorrow, masking their relief as the hunter takes hold of the man. They all owed him money. They arrive at a cabin in the woods where we learn some more about Isidore, that in 1870 he was an occultist who wrote a book about the structure and order of hell, even at a cult that was built around the book in the 1960s. The nun mentions that she had found the book and it allowed her to separate what had happened to her in relation to the puzzle box and her faith in God. They want Isidore's help, though the word balloon there makes it look like it's Isidore himself asking for their help. Anyway, he says he can't remember how he solved the lament configuration to escape from hell, but that this is actually his second escape. The first, when he wrote that book, was intentional on Leviathan's part. It knew, you see, that I would write such a book. It wanted exposure. My god, Leviathan is evil! It encourages creative people to work for exposure! For 50 years, I've had to listen to the screams of those I damned. And the worst part is that that book was still panned by critics. He wonders if his latest escape is just another attempt by Leviathan for some bigger scheme, but Lee puts that down. They've discovered that all the puzzle boxes and devices are parts of Leviathan and thus are connected to it. That moment when Leviathan reconfigured itself and screamed in pain coincides to when their group destroyed one of the puzzles. My god, child. If it's true, then I owe you more than excuses. Here's a coupon for my next book. We're about a quarter of the way through the comic, and as you may have noticed, it's a bit of a massive exposition dump throughout this whole thing without a lot of characterization, and I think that's a mistake. We're gonna lose Isidore in a minute, and I feel like we should have spent more time with him in the cabin so we could flesh out our principal characters. However, let's continue. The priest, named Garcia, is instructed by Isidore to saw off his leg. He explains that Leviathan's evil is physical, which I suppose is an interesting way of interpreting what the Cenobites do. That physical pleasure and pain are manifestations of Leviathan's power versus some evil energy or negative emotions or 
bad vibes or whatever. And thus, when Isidore was stabbed by the creature earlier, that evil was spread to his leg. His leg, in particular his bone, is now a part of Leviathan. Using a grinder that can sharpen one end of it into a stake, a weapon they can use to fight off Leviathan's creatures. Again, it's a ton of exposition where we still don't even know the nun's name. They're found by another of Leviathan's creatures, this one with a lower jaw that's just hanging from its face. Apparently Leviathan's health coverage doesn't include dental. They kill that one with the stake before the one from before arrives. They stab that one in the arm with the stake, and while it's able to break it in half, even a wound to its arm is enough to briefly incapacitate it. They rush through the dark passage through steaming puddles of dissolving flesh that fill the room with the smell of pork and sulfur. Ah, like stepping into a Hardy's. They want to carry Isidore out with them, but he says he needs to be left behind, asking for Garcia's gun. The creature recovers and goes after him, dragging him in closer, but Isidore figures out another way to try to hurt it, putting the gun into his palm and shooting multiple times at it, figuring that the splinters of bone that go along for the ride might injure the creature as well. It does, but it also allows Garcia to return and impale the creature on the splintered bone stake, finally killing it. They want to bring Isidore to a hospital, but he says they're there's no time, and he needs to be sacrificed to buy them the time they need. I die, father. Please do as I ask and bury me. Not in Earth. In Leviathan. Stick me like a knife in its gut, forever a part of its pain. Well, okay, but that still means we need to haul your body out of here. No, they set the place on fire and make their escape, heading to Toledo, Spain. Our heroes are hunting down an old crone, demanding to know where something is. When she claims she's just an old woman, they shoot her. Raising Hell Part 2. No one ever dies in hell. This woman, however, is very dead. We finally get the name of our nun, Helen, as she searches the body for something but can't find it in her bag. Lee, however, searches her more thoroughly and finds a necklace shaped like Leviathan. With that, the crone springs to life and her body friggin' explodes, changing into the skeletal dragon demon thing from the end of the first movie. The movie never explained what the hell it was, but pretty much every piece of subsequent associated lore with the series indicates that it's some kind of guardian of the box, meant to protect it and help facilitate its passing on to another owner. It tries to get away from the group, but Garcia helps grab hold of its leg and flies up with it, producing an awesome image of him repeatedly shooting the thing right into its rib cage while they're in the air, which is unfortunately ruined a bit by the child drawings of buildings beneath him. Like, did the artist injure their hand doing this gorgeously badass shot of taking down a demon like this and couldn't properly finish those buildings? What the hell? Anyway, the Guardian is reduced to ashes as it crashes back to the ground. Garcia naturally exhausted and injured from doing something so amazing. Although mostly from the hole crashing down into the ground from like 50 feet in the air. We cut to the next morning at a house. There is no hope in hell. There is no love. Only pain. You're not exactly selling me on this resort. Those who manage to escape, to find their way out of that empty pit, often discover that the meat hooks, the razors, the darkness of Leviathan's world has destroyed more than just their flesh. Their credit rating was also shredded. Helen is patching up Garcia's injuries, with quite a few stitches as we see in the bottom panel, yeesh, and is curious why none of them ever talk about their lives beforehand. Yeah, if it wasn't obvious by now, all of these three are people who have escaped from Leviathan before, much like Frank in the first movie. Only they're not total assholes like him. It's definitely an interesting concept, and I do wonder how they got out with their flesh intact considering how gooey Frank was, but given the exposition dump in the first part, it's odd that they never explicitly say that's what their deal is. Also, the foreshortening in this shot is kind of weird, as if the artist really wanted to push Helen's ass out at us as she's leaning over. Anyway, Garcia explains his backstory. I killed my first man when I was 14, a general. He came to the town where I lived. He did not leave. Why? He was leading his army against his own people. I had lost six brothers to that war. I was full of hate. I had a gun. All in all, second worst spring break I ever had. After eventually winding up in prison, he found the box and used it. When he first escaped from hell, he became a priest because he needed something to believe in. A hope in something better for the afterlife, and life itself, than what he endured at the hands of the Cenobites. Garcia is still pretty traumatized by it and finds comfort in Helen's arms. The narration explains what's up. 
Their plan is a simple one. Rob three casinos in one night. To hunt the guardians, to steal the puzzles, the keys to hell, and to destroy them. Interestingly, this was also the plot to Boom Studios' Hellraiser comics. Not necessarily destroying Leviathan, but basically cutting off the Cenobites from Earth. Although that involved Kirstie and a group of her own friends instead of just three random people. Anyway, the narration continues. Lee destroyed one by accident with a laser. He knows it can be done. Well, now I just want a Hellraiser sequel with someone running around shooting lasers at Cenobites. He works on figuring out this particular puzzle, though if he was able to use a laser once before, why not try that again? Anyway, when he notes that Helen and Garcia are spending more romantic time together, it's subtly implied that he's kind of jealous about it. Not that he wants Helen, just that it means he's not as close to them anymore. We learn Helen's backstory finally, that she fell in love with a new priest at her parish, but he disappeared, leaving only a puzzle. She thought that if she saw that she could get him back. And obviously that didn't work out. She's the opposite of Garcia. She seems to have lost her faith in God after experiencing hell, not thinking a loving God could send anyone there. Few days later, Lee comes running in with an unconscious woman. He says he doesn't know who she is, but he found something in her pocket. It's... a blank piece of paper? I don't know what the hell this is supposed to be. I thought maybe it was just something weird with my scans, which is still possible, since sadly The Spring Slaughter is the only epic Hellraiser comic that I don't own a physical copy of. Maybe it's supposed to be like a lament configuration that's glowing? The comic seems to be implying that this woman, Rachel, has escaped from hell, but I don't know what this is. Or how she got clothes. In any case, she recovers and we learn that they've actually been collecting tons of the puzzles by this point, all locked in a cabinet. Rachel expresses some concern about all of them in one place, but Lee says that after a while of his own torture in hell, he just stopped caring. I just started giggling, laughing, like I was high or something. I called the Cenobite a wimp, told him to take his best shot, and no matter what he did, I just kept saying, Yeah, yeah, you can't kill me. Hey, my sole purpose might be to torture you for all eternity, but that doesn't mean I don't have feelings. Now I don't even want to flay your skin. Pinhead, I'm taking a personal day. Get Butterball to cover my shift. Rachel and Lee start making out, Lee clearly wanting some companionship after Garcia and Helen hooked up, but of course we quickly discover that Rachel is a plant. Lee wakes up in the middle of the night to discover Rachel in the cellar, having, I guess, activated all the puzzle boxes because we got ourselves a crap ton of Cenobites. And it seems I spoke too soon a couple weeks ago because indeed we have a cameo from Pinhead in this shot. But don't assume he's sticking around. This is just a quick rest stop for him on his way to see Rhonda Shear. But I'll see you in hell. You sweet talker, you. I wonder what the story is behind this Cenobite with forks for arms. That seems like a movie in itself. Anyway, Garcia and Helen hear Lee's screams and quickly deduce what happened, the two retreating to a nearby abandoned church as the Cenobites pursue. Not wanting to be taken back to hell, they elect to kill themselves with a dagger. Unfortunately, despite both dying from it, they just wake up again right where they died. It's not explained how they failed to die. Maybe their escape from hell means they can't actually die now? But in any case, the Cenobites enter and reclaim them, pulling them away. Rachel wants to be set free, as per the deal she had made, but the agreement was also to deliver Isidore. And while she says that Isidore is dead, the Cenobites are just like, Maybe, but the deal was for all four of them, so sucks to be you. Man, if you can't even trust demons from hell to honor an agreement, who can you trust? For some reason, part two requires an epilogue. It's already weird enough when single-issue comics have chapters or parts to them like this, but why does it need an epilogue when there's still a whole other part? In any case, in hell, Lee is being tortured by some weird elephant-looking Cenobite. He mocks it as he cuts open his own stomach, revealing that he had swallowed the puzzle necklace. I guess just for this occasion, and he uses it to escape from hell again. We begin part three with Lee cutting off his pinky finger without any sign of anesthetic or anything like that because he's making lots of good decisions today. So what is he doing? Well, as we established, body parts that have made contact with aspects of Leviathan become corrupted by it. 
so he's chopping up a finger to use its bone for buckshot. Lee is haunted by how Helen and Garcia are no doubt being tortured in hell, and how it's kind of his fault. As such, he's planning a rescue mission. Each bullet shell is covered with a paste made from ground black knuckle bone. Whether or not the bullets will work in hell is one of the least of his concerns. Seems like it should be a pretty big concern, unless he wants this rescue mission to end ten seconds into it. Unfortunately, he's been unable to use the necklace puzzle to re-enter hell. In the pit of his stomach, he knows he can never solve it. Only desire can solve the puzzle, not guilt. That that's news to Tiffany from Hellbound. Sure, they didn't attack her because she didn't really want them, but she was still able to solve the puzzle. Anyway, he comes up with a plan. That is why he needs Lewis. Dude, I suck at puzzles too. I'm just as likely to pry pieces off of it and reconfigure them like what someone does with a Rubik's Cube than actually solve it. In the water and vomit spiraling down the bowl, he sees a screaming face. As he falls asleep against the cold porcelain, he wonders whose face it was. Oh hey, so that's what happened to Wormface's original face. The Lewis that he refers to is a submissive from a gay S&M club. Lee met Lewis here two weeks ago. Dude gets back from hell and first thing he does is go to a sex club? or has like no time passed at all, and he went to the sex club before going to see Isidore. Lewis's partner slash pimp slash whatever, Victor, is loaning Lewis out to Lee for his purposes. It's kind of a clever plan. He ties Lewis up in bondage gear and hands him the puzzle box, telling him to solve it, restore it to normal, wait an hour, and then solve it again. Lewis, of course, has no idea what the hell this all means, just thinking it to be a kink, although I don't think opening up a portal to hell really falls under safe, sane, and consensual. Since Lewis is filled with desire, he easily solves the puzzle. Lee's plan is underway, killing the Cenobite that the puzzle summoned and having a dog track Helen's scent in hell. Helen, unfortunately, is currently a pile of goo and hair. Still, Lee's not worried. As established in the first two movies, sometimes even a single drop of blood is enough to restore someone from hell. Mind you, she's gonna be really back into the nun look again because it'll cover up her, you know, lack of skin, but still. Next up is Garcia, who's missing his head, and his feet have fallen off. Still, again, he's got the remains, so he makes his way back to where he entered hell. Unfortunately, once he returns to the spot, he discovers the Cenobite whom he had killed has not died, and in fact has murdered Lewis. The Cenobite laughs off this whole thing, instructing him to drop the remains of his friends and he's free to go. He knows that now that Lewis has been added to his conscience, he'll try another rescue and... Well, he's already proven he can't solve the puzzles on his own, and he'll need someone else, and etc, etc. Unfortunately, this experience has now filled him with despair, and he decides to shoot himself, too overwrought with guilt over everything. And also, unfortunately, the comic decides to show us the blast in mid-action. It's not as tasteless as when Rob Liefeld depicted a suicide in Youngblood No. 10, but it's still unnecessarily gory for a dramatic moment. And so our comic ends on a bit of a surprise. Garcia and Helen narrate that they can feel heat and can see light, and a hand bursts out of Lee's stomach. Lee ate them? Dude, why didn't you just bring a bag? I kid, of course. This comic is actually pretty good, but not great. The premise is very intriguing, probably why it was the starting premise for the Boom Studios Hellraiser comics. People trying to combat the Cenobites and bring an end to Leviathan. The writing is a bit weak in places, though. As I said earlier, a lot of exposition gets dumped in the first part while not giving us anything about the characters themselves aside from Isidore. And even that's just more exposition. Once we get into part two, we get a lot of character stuff, but it feels like we could have had even more if they had tried for it in the first part. It would have really made us feel more for these people and their eventual tragic fates. Hell, we're not even sure of Lee's full story, just of what happened when he originally escaped Hell. Lee's attempted rescue was pretty enjoyable, but it feels like the artist was phoning it in a bit. Not only the splash page with a ton of text near the end, but hell seems really sparse and dull when Lee 
is on his rescue mission. The artwork overall is competent, but I think the Cenobite designs were a bit too cartoony in spots for my taste. But otherwise, this is pretty damn enjoyable. Still have no idea why the hell this is called Spring Slaughter, but at least it's not teasing spring stuff throughout and then not delivering. It's an overall good outing, but it feels like it could have been a lot more than it is. Next time, we celebrate atop the fourth wall's 11th anniversary with more of the Clone Saga. Hello and welcome to a shock the fourth wall. <laughs> It's Halloween time again, everybody! Let us talk of spooks and specters, of slashers and slayings! Let us talk about all of it! Because now Moarte Set is right next to me, and that's all he's gonna talk about anyway, so I might as well lean into it. It's the final year we'll be talking about Hellraiser comics. Sure, some could say that the first time, done during the 10th anniversary, didn't really count since it was only a single comic, an adaptation of Hellraiser 3, but the truth is that Hellraiser has a pretty low track record in terms of bad comics. Sure, bad individual stories in some of the anthologies, but overall, not bad at all. Boom Studios had an ongoing Hellraiser series that started off really well, and kind of devolved afterwards into an apocalyptic story, which feels wholly wrong for Hellraiser, which admittedly is also one of the reasons why Hellraiser 3 doesn't work, in my opinion. There was also a spin-off of the epic comics Hellraiser book called The Harrowers, which was kind of a mix of superhero and Hellraiser, wherein a group of people got powers to fight against the Cenobites. It was kind of neat, but not really what I go to this franchise for. I could talk about any of these books, but they're also really long and not really keeping with the spirit of the type of stuff I cover at Halloween. And frankly, with the exception exception of the Hellraiser 3 review, we've kind of been bereft of the central figure of this series. Basically, the monster that makes Hellraiser what it is. Pinhead! The anthologies focused on a ton of different Cenobites of varying designs and modus operandi, from the abstract to the less than subtle, and yet not enough is given to basically the face of the franchise. I wonder if Marvel and Epic felt the same way, because in 1993 we got ourselves a six-issue miniseries focused around Pinhead. As a quick introduction to his backstory in the movies, in case you've missed the Hellraiser 3 review, Pinhead used to be Captain Elliot Spencer, a British officer in World War I who, upon witnessing firsthand the horrors of the war, sought hedonistic pleasure and gratification to escape the trauma. He found and used the Lament Configuration, upon which he was transformed into Pinhead, wiping his memory of his former life. However, this comic decides to delve into the Pinhead persona throughout history and expand that backstory for the demonic side of things. So let's dig into Pinhead, number one to three, and see if this story has so many divine pleasures for us. Or if our suffering will be legendary even in hell. Issue 1's cover is... yeesh. Like, the Cenobites are all about the pain and pleasure thing, but probably not a good sign when what I'm presuming is a scream of pain looks more like a yawn from waking up. The box. You opened it. We came. Look, I'm sorry. I haven't had my coffee yet. Let's, let's just get going, okay? What's more interesting is that Pinhead has two very different styles of pins on his head. One, the standard nails, and the other, some kind of dart-like things coming out the other side, hinting at things to come in the story. I do love the picture of actual Doug Bradley Pinhead in the corner with an expression that reads, What the hell am I even looking at? First pain-packed issue! Oh, well that's always a good sign, that this issue will bring me pain. The whole cover's art style feels very 90s, and the first page does not help. One of the nice things about the Hellraiser anthology is that it showed a variety of styles. Some more abstract, some more photorealistic, some more traditional comic book art, and some like this, where much like Pinhead on the cover, apparently the creators thought that people went to Hellraiser to see people's uvulas. Anyway, yeah, we open with this guy getting a bunch of chains sent at him from the Lament configuration. Welcome to Hell, a planned community! 
Forget all you know about boiling pits of sulfur and crazed imps waving pitchforks. This torment is far more precise in its damnation. You have to sit through ads on a streaming service, and then the video fails to load. Again. And again. FOREVER! The narration explains how this guy, Bobby Marucci, obtained the box in Mexico. The puzzle box cost Bobby three dollars, an unspeakable sex act, and most of his self-respect. What's weird is all three of those can be explained as Nutrigrain Bar. Months later, not knowing what the box was, he just casually started playing with it before becoming obsessed with solving it. Leading to now, wherein it opens a doorway for the Cenobites. Weird how in the movies it takes the people who actually want to solve the box, like, months to do so, but everyone who doesn't give a crap about it figures it out in 30 seconds. Maybe the sex-obsessed ones just suck at puzzles? Pinhead, of course, emerges last, as the guy claims he didn't know what the box would bring. All flesh has desire. It only needs to be made aware, given a proper lesson in anguish by a most wicked teacher. They shall assign you all the homework over spring break! Using the box, Butterball starts retracting the chains in Bobby to peel off his skin, but then suddenly the rest of Pinhead's entourage start vanishing. Bobby begins laughing. It wasn't supposed to go that way, was it? With the butterball, the bitch, the chatterer, something went wrong! Well, definitely so. After all, how did you know the other two were named Butterball and Chatterer, but needed to resort to sexist insults for the female Cenobite, aka Deep Throat? Where's the order in that, you pinheaded freak? Where's your precious order now? And he slices him up. Restored. By way of your evisceration! Making a mess by slicing him in half seems like the opposite of order. There is the stench of chaos. Wait! False alarm! I think someone just microwaved some pizza rolls. We cut to Leviathan, the diamond-shaped god thing that the Cenobites worship. Hell with a view. And it's rent-controlled. A Cenobite, or at least some kind of demon who was once a person named Ludovico Maria Sinistrari, rants loudly to himself near some kind of machine how much he hates working for Leviathan for the last several decades, but that his plan is nearing fruition. In which case, maybe it's a bad idea to loudly rant about it where anyone can hear you. And that's all we needed right now, I guess, because now we cut over to the Temple of Scars. Because even demons pray for some kind of salvation, although they would settle for a working air conditioner. The Hell Priest giving his sermon talks about the idea of Leviathan waging war on flesh itself. The concept being that the piercings and nails and stuff are a ritual that allows them to remake chaotic forms more orderly. I don't know, seems to me like your skin is doing a fine enough job of staying on without driving nails into your skull, but I don't know, maybe they need like a surplus of order to meet the quotas. I want to know what the deal is with this skeleton demon in the background who apparently has his head mounted onto a wall. Was that his choice? Or was he like a piece of art that was granted life? The Hell Priest, however, starts saying that maybe they shouldn't be following Leviathan because the Cenobites are disappearing and their leaders aren't providing any explanation for what's going on. Typical politicians, am I right? Unfortunately, that means we are reintroduced to Atkins, aka the worst idea for a Cenobite ever. A grim and gritty, gun-toting Liefeld character, but also a demon! He shoots the Hell Priest's head off and asks what the hell's gotten into everyone that they'd be ready to spread anarchy based on this kind of traitorous talk. The Doomsayer's methods were dubious, Atkins. His message was not. Yeah, but the same could be said of Doomsayer. Doomsay. Huh? 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 Oh, oh, right, um, Atkins is stupid! After some more arguments, some of the Cenobites decide to go find Pinhead and figure out what the hell's going on. They find him removing the pins from his head in some chamber, also spotting a bunch of skins hanging from a wall. One with the darts in his head, like in the cover, and one with buzz saws in there, which is really more amusing because Cabin in the Woods had a pinhead pastiche who also had buzz saws in his head. It would appear our leader has played more than one role down through the ages. He also apparently molts a lot. 
Pinhead, returning the nails back into himself, confronts them, particularly Atkins for his buffoonery. However, before we can see more of Atkins getting taken down a peg, we have a flashback to 1879, where a priest is giving a sermon to a congregation. Afterwards, everyone talks about how eloquently he was speaking, but the priest himself is soon confronted by a demon who berates him for adding on, go in peace, at the end of the sermon. Since soon, the Cenobites will be coming for them, and they need the congregation ready for for war. And then it's time for a dream sequence! This one coming from Ludovico. It shows his conception, his father being some kind of person quite literally brainwashed by the Cenobites. Seriously, they opened up his brain. For this task before killing himself. After his mother died in childbirth, the young Ludovico solved some kind of elaborate rope puzzle that brought him back into the fold of the Cenobites. That was 113 years ago. He's still paying his mother's hospital bill. Pinhead goes to see Ludovico, having apparently made some deal with him. Finish construction on some project for hell, and he'll not only be set free, but his youth restored. Pinhead acquiesces to the agreement, and apparently one of the sides that he carries can, like, make a younger version of you to step out of your old body, since slashing Ludovico with it creates the young Ludovico. However, the guy knows that the contraption that he's built requires that he himself be a part of it, and knew that Hell planned to betray him. So he just willingly puts himself into the machine so that he can still be freed from being Leviathan's slave in death. Not exactly sure what the original purpose of this thing was, unless they always knew the Cenobites disappearing would be a thing, as suggested during the Hell Priest scene where there was apparently a prophecy or something. But it apparently allows them to figure out what the source of this recent upheaval is. Just Ludovico's revenge is that it will actually send Pinhead back in time to it, into his earlier body in 1876. Although this is apparently a typo since everything else says this is 1879. The body with the darts in his head. Apparently at the time, whatever Pinhead was called, he was in the midst of the Sioux tribe's Okipa ritual. Not sure how accurate this is to the real thing, but the point is he's put into his old body. And apparently his previous mind is still there and has to talk to him. His future self explains the situation to his younger self that Leviathan is threatened in the future by a disorder that undoes the creation of the Cenobites. The younger self understands and agrees, but warns him that because he hasn't been summoned here via the puzzle box, he won't have his full powers. And that if he needs to time travel anymore, other past versions of himself might not be as cooperative. I appreciate your concern. Your psychic dismemberment will be quick and merciful. This is a weird adaptation of Days of Future Past. The crew of other Cenobites have come to the time travel death chamber room, whatever, to investigate what happened. And it includes skeleton attached to a bored dude. Apparently its name is Gehenna, and I suddenly want it to be the main character. Face, whom we've seen before and is one of the more interesting of the Cenobites introduced in the epic comics, interrogates the remains of Ludovico. Why did he think he was escaping Leviathan's clutches if people can still talk to his skin? Who reveals that this machine will bring Leviathan down? Atkins is Atkins. Prepubescent here is gonna grease these wheels so we can go on a little rescue op and set things straight. Ain't ya snot nose? Better do what I say or I'll shoot your torn up bloody remains like all the best Hellraiser scenes! Ludovico warns them that while they could follow Pinhead back in time, they'll be away from Leviathan's power that enables their existence, and thus easy pickings for the unknown adversary that's taking out the other Cenobites. Back in the past with the Preacher, he's busy feeling up a female demon's boobs. That's not even an exaggeration. I have to censor it for YouTube, but what I'm more amused by is that the letterer apparently put the demon's word balloon in the wrong place, so it looks like he's telling himself, Satisfy your puerile desires so we can get on with the real business of the night. But what are the preacher's thoughts on demon boobs? I never knew, Aggregate. I never expected such... variety. Okay, as the guy who has the uncensored version, the hell is he talking about? It's just two breasts. What variety? Anyway, the demon, known as Aggregate, tells him to knock it off and be ready for the return of a posse he sent out to take the Cenobite that's after them. And indeed, we soon see the posse as they chase after Pinhead. 
Or rather, those aren't darts he has in his skull, but arrowheads, as they say. The posse are a group of cowboys ready to fight evil, but it seems Pinhead has a collection of other Cenobites in this time period to call upon that are all Western-themed. Snake Oil, Hangman, Fan Dancer, and Dixie. They're kinda neat designs, except for Dixie, because he's just a Confederate soldier without legs and his mouth stitched shut, and screw the Confederacy. This brings us to our next issue. The cover for issue two is fine, just shows off the Western Cenobites. With a little help from from Perdition's Posse. So if they're all Western themed to the point that their group name is like that, what's Pinhead's modern group called? Malignant Matrix fans? We open in the middle of a showdown between a gunfighter and, shockingly of all people, Atkins. Yeah, they actually sent Atkins back in time despite the warning, and it gave him a more period-appropriate motif, with a chain gun fed by the bullets embedded in his skin. It's your funeral, partner! Your funeral and every other horse shit stained cowboy in this boot hill of a town! I reckon this ain't for your eyes! So after killing half the town with that maneuver, his gun jams and he's grabbed by Fan Dancer and Dixie. Realizing they work for Pinhead, he joins the two as they berate him for being so frivolous with the murder and mayhem. Back in the present, the Cenobites gathered around Pinhead exposit what's happened and how the machine was indeed supposed to send someone back in time to try to identify the threat they face. Why a time machine exactly? I mean, it's not a bad solution, just... Seems like a weird way to solve the problem. It'd be like if I invented faster than light travel to get my wallet I left at a store. Sure, it does the trick, but it's overkill. But in this case, it sent Pinhead's essence back without his full body. Ludovico says that Atkins' own journey into the past will only take him part of the way, and the rest will only be able to join Pinhead during other time segments, and that they're all doomed to failure. I'd question how the hell he knows that, but he invented a time machine that sends a demon's essence back into its own previous lifetime without causing the space-time continuum to throw up all over itself. I just have to kind of accept all this. So back in the past, Fan Dancer reveals that the Perdition Posse, or rather the Sufferers Guild as her group is called, are not actually Cenobites. Are they demons? Eh, I really cannot tell. Some of them look pretty skeletal, but in any case, whatever they are, they're followers of Leviathan while not being a direct part of Pinhead's order. As it happens, he's called Scarred Hide here, which is especially odd since Arrowhead actually works pretty well as a nickname in this time period. And they head into an abandoned mine shaft for their base as they hide from the local sheriff and his deputies that have been sent after them thanks to the priest's sermons. We also have some minor character bits for Atkins, reminding us that he was a Vietnam War soldier who became a Cenobite when he solved a puzzle of underground tunnels, showing his reluctance to enter the mine shaft from that. However, any attempts at making Atkins sympathetic are immediately undone by us having to spend any amount of time with him, so good job there! Pinhead is doing his own sermonizing about pain and mutilation while they torture a bunch of their pursuers. He's apparently not at all surprised by Atkins' presence, ordering him to go find the sheriff, since it might help lead them to the enemy they're actually here for. Listen, Scarred! I don't recon with no skirt! You know, for all the hate that the direct-to-video Hellraiser movies get, some of it justified, some of it not, at least they never... Ever had anything as stupid and terrible as Atkins in them? I mean, maybe Hellworld. We cut over to the preacher and aggregate, and thanks to the narration, I finally understand what the hell he was talking about earlier about variety, since this is what it says The hands of the thing. Things calling themselves aggregate. Yeah, aggregate is apparently supposed to be some kind of gestalt entity. I guess the name is kind of a giveaway to that, but it's only now that I get that because we can see a close up of its hands, where the fingers are the wrong lengths. Except there are no other differing colors or anything to indicate the idea of incorporating different parts or people into one whole. I thought it was just some malformed purple demon thing. Where in the art was I supposed to get their whole shtick? Anyway, after the priest keeps wanting to feel up Aggregate, they slap him away, telling him about some key that will unlock Leviathan and what awaits inside of it. Kind of an interesting idea. 
The Mythos kind of take for granted the fact that Leviathan is a living being, but by all appearances, it's a giant structure. So maybe there's something more to the giant diamond that's inside of that structure. Anyway, Atkins and Fandancer chase the sheriff through the mine shaft. Not sure when the hell they got him in there. As Atkins recounts his backstory to her. He says he never sought out anything like this, but he's the kind of guy who needs rules to follow. You do nothing but question the rules and hire authority! In one of the few ongoing bits in the anthology, you are punished for doing the exact opposite of what you are supposed to do! Cause I get the job done, they look the other way and let me do it my way! You don't though! You are an embarrassment and failure in everything we see with you in it! If this franchise revolved around you, it'd be called Hell Sinker! Speaking of the anthology, apparently they decided to call back to the first issue, the one I covered last year, with that brief but pointless story involving the card game for the Lament configuration. And some commenters apparently thought that I didn't understand the story, the idea that the most valuable thing on Earth was his life free of the Lament configuration. No, 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 I got that. It's just that it seemed kind of pointless because nothing happened in that story. It's like, yeah, you could have had horrible demons and torment and pain and evil, but nah, I'm just walking away without you even knowing what could happen. Bye! Anyway, to show off how every other character is far more interesting than Atkins, Fandancer tries to convince the sheriff to join up by offering a softer pitch of the Cenobite way of life. Sensation, experience, getting to feel things far beyond what a normal human life can offer. But the sheriff just feels he's failed as the town protector and commits suicide despite Fan Dancer's attempts to save him. Still, he tells them that it was the priest who set them on to their group and where they can find him. As the events from the anthology story play out and finish up, Back in the present, we start learning of what exactly the threat finally is. Someone is altering the history of the Cenobites. And next up is the guy who played that poker game in the anthology story. If his puzzle is taken away, every Cenobite who was created after that point by him will vanish. Which I guess explains why they needed a time machine in the first place, but how did they know they would need one? Especially how did they know they would need one a hundred years ago when they first got Ludovico to start building the thing? And indeed, in town, the priest uses the Book of Leviathan to transform that poker player into the skeletal dragon demon thing from the first movie that took on the form of the homeless dude, a guardian of the Lament configuration. It shoves the priest aside before he can grab the box, but then aggregate attacks, saying that they've done their time in hell and are going to ensure that everyone has a chance to escape it. However, before they can use the box, the Perdition Posse attack and fight off Aggregate. Aggregate manages to kill Hangman, Dixie, and Snake Oil, and by the time the others get to them, Atkins starts vanishing. You're becoming no more, Cenobite. That configuration was part of your origin, and what we have done here has disrupted that pattern of creation! Oh no, so terrible. Aggregate reclaims the box and runs off, but gets their foot stuck in some railroad tracks. They claim that they know Pinhead. Conveniently, a train is happening by, and Aggregate tells Pinhead to go after them as they get hit by the train. Kinda disappointed that Aggregate didn't have purple blood, like some demonic version of the Grape Escape board game. With nothing left here, Pinhead says his farewell to Fandancer, and... I guess Quantum leaps into another past form, this time in Paris of 1728. It's the Church of St. Medard. The magistrate and one of the priests, Father DePage, await the arrival of a representative of the Vatican to investigate strange occurrences at the church. And said representative is Pinhead, who apparently has much more ornate pins in his head in this time. The Holy Father sends his greetings. Sorry if I seem a bit grumpy, this carriage has a low ceiling and it keeps pushing these things in deeper. That ends issue two and brings us to the last issue we'll talk about today. Cover for that one shows Pinhead apparently attacking this earlier incarnation. Not a bad cover, though it gives us a better look at this incarnation. No segmented scars on his head, and he even has facial hair. I think it's called an Imperial? Anyway, we open back in 1879. Apparently Balbareth, the librarian Cenobite we've seen before, has traveled back to help Fandancer collect the remains of Aggregate. Really all we get is Fandancer giving her backstory, except there's no point because she's gone from the story after this. I don't know, maybe this is referencing another story from the anthology? 
It was a couple years ago I read all these, and there were a lot of stories in those 20 issues, so it's hard for me to remember them all. Anyway, yet again, she has a more interesting story than Atkins, and Belbareth just tells a more edgy version of Sleeping Beauty to her for no reason other than padding. And it's not surprising that we need padding. Someone decided that these individual issues should be extra length. 28 pages each, despite the story not justifying that added length. Anyway, Balbareth now travels back in time again with the remains. At the church, the pinhead equivalent, a monsignor, observes various miracles being performed in the churchyard. One is that a poor woman with an infected wound on her leg has said wound licked, and the leg instantly heals. Another is... Grosser. Vomiting milk. As fine as that produced by any cow. Okay, but who was the one who decided, you know what, I'm going to try this woman's vomit to see if it's like fresh milk. The occurrences began after the previous former leader of the parish was buried, Deacon Francois de Paris. Before the Monsignor can investigate further, Pinhead's essence is transferred into him, and, as warned, he's not welcomed by the Monsignor, who thinks this is some kind of trick. After yet another exposition recap for those back in hell, Balbareth arrives in 1728 to help Pinhead with his mental struggle, appearing in the guise of a nun. This holy oil... It has curative properties! It's also great for pan-searing steak. The oil empowers Pinhead and allows him to take control, though his body is tired from the experience, and Balbareth takes him away. In the courtyard, a woman puts her face right in the middle of fire and tells the father, who had sent for the Monsignor, to seek out Aggregate at the Rue de Revanche to get the answers he seeks about all this. Balbareth shows the parts of Aggregate to Pinhead, indicating that none of them match from the same person. Though Pinhead points out that this isn't actually particularly helpful information, since it's not like Leviathan is hurting for enemies who would do something like this. In the meantime, they believe that the miracles in the churchyard are actually a puzzle, much like any of the more abstract summoning devices for Cenobites, and in turn, solving it may be connected to Aggregate in their mission. Also, we've got yet another connection to one of the stories from the first issue of the anthology. The priest we had seen earlier, Father Jean de Page, is apparently a descendant of the baby left behind by Father Robotai. Yeah, yeah, I pronounced it wrong last year, I'm not French. And Lady Carillion. And said descendant is now struggling to understand if these miracles are good or evil. I swear to God, I did not plan for the story to connect to last year. I didn't realize there was any follow-up on stuff from the anthologies in this form. It's kinda neat, even though it feels more like pointless fan service than anything significant to the story. Balbareth studies a story that was in the deceased deacon's possession about a boy who tricked the devil via transformation, eventually turning into a wolf to eat the devil while he was in the form of a chicken. Story, Deacon de Paris? Or parable? Mostly just the lesson, never transform into a chicken for they are tasty. Put the pieces of grain together and they become a mischievous boy. Put the pieces of body together and they become... A piece of grain! Of course! Father DePage travels to Rue de Revanche and finds Aggregate, who's hiding their appearance behind some bandages and gloves. They show him a crap ton of cats that they've murdered, because cats serve the devil, you see, and promises to help reveal the truths of good and evil to him if he joins forces with them. Belbareth, in the meantime, shows Pinhead what she thinks Aggregate is after, a puzzle configuration known as the Pellucid Lens. If you place the interlocking crystals inside of it the correct way, it casts a beam straight to hell. It's of personal significance to Balbareth because it's the puzzle that led her to becoming a Cenobite. Unfortunately, the conversation gets quickly tabled as Aggregate arrives and easily overpowers Pinhead, lacking the infernal magic that he would have if summoned by a puzzle, plus lacking any kind of posse to help him shoot at Aggregate this time. Before he can use a blade to fight back, though, the Monsignor on the mental scape returns, apparently playing out some porn version of Red Riding Hood, where Pinhead becomes the titular Red Riding Hood, while Monsignor plays the wolf, and they're supposed to have sex or something at the end, but first, Pinhead as Little Red Riding Hood has to eat some of the dead grandmother, too? This is weird! Anyway, point is that Aggregate and Father DePage open up the Deacon's tomb and find the Pellucid lens in it. In the mindscape, the wolf eats Red Riding Hood, 
but that just allows Pinhead to infect the Monsignor and take control again. Balbareth disappears due to time changing with the lens, and Aggregate teleports away, probably back in time. Oh, and I'm guessing the whole getting hit by a train thing was just more of a mild inconvenience for them, because hell magic or whatever. Otherwise, they never explain how they survived that. Pinhead recovers, and DePage is left wondering what the hell just happened. Pinhead notices the necklace that DePage wears actually holds one of the focusing crystals of the Pellucid Lens, meaning the puzzle is incomplete. He hand waves that the miracles were caused by the disparity of energies between the configuration and its missing element. Using multimodal reflection sorting. He takes the necklace and travels back in time once more, ending the issue with his form in Mayan times. The Warrior Topek. These comics are... a mixed bag so far. I would not call them horrible, but this plot is just bizarre. Time-traveling demons trying to stop another demon, and occasionally we get some philosophizing about the Cenobites' purpose. I'm not sure how keen I actually am with stories like this, where we see so much of it from the Cenobites' perspective. There was some of this to a degree in Hellraiser Judgment, which I liked, but there was still a primary narrative of human characters driving events, versus this, which is just, oh no, the bad guys might get undone by other bad guys. Feel bad about it. And honestly, it's hard for me to be upset when Aggregate's mission also ended up unmaking Atkins from time, which I am all in favor of. Still, the world building is top notch. Diving head deep into the demonic way of well, life, I guess, is the term, despite them being what they are. With characters in these stories having pretty well thought out backstories and character motivations, even though they're not going to be seen again. Tying it back to the anthologies is very clever, because even if it doesn't amount to much, it lends some weight to this whole world that was created in the epic Hellraiser comics. Next time, we'll see what it is Aggregate is after, and how far back we'll be doing the time warp with Pinhead. Hello and welcome to A SHOCK THE FOURTH WALL! We conclude our look at the Hellraiser miniseries named after the chief monster associated with it, Pinhead. And yeah, no previously on segment. I know it's been a long while since one of those, but we've got a lot of comics to cover and hell, do shows even still have those for me to spoof anymore? Well, we still have this part. Last time on Pinhead! Other kinds of pins in his head. Well, specifically, Pinhead, the poster child of the Cenobites, is investigating how other members of his order have started disappearing. Somehow, the forces of Hell have been anticipating this, since a hundred years ago, they actually orchestrated the birth of a child that would build them a demonic time machine that could allow them to go back and prevent whatever force was traveling back through time to do this. Unfortunately, that dude was kind of pissed about the whole thing, so his time machine only sent Pinhead's essence back in time, which allowed him to possess his earlier forms. Yeah, many people were confused about this because the movies seem to establish that a guy was transformed into Pinhead, not that he was a separate entity from him. Well, Hellraiser 3 seemed to imply that the Pinhead form was actually a demonic force in its own right, but needed a human host bound to it to kind of ground it so that it wasn't cackling like an idiot, spouting one-liners, making Cenobites out of CD players, and killing people at random. As such, in cowboy times and at a church in 1700s France, Pinhead fought some kind of demonic gestalt creature known as Aggregate, who's stealing various puzzle configurations throughout history for some scheme of their own. This has resulted in two of the more recurring Cenobites from the epic comics Hellraiser books, Balbareth and Atkins, to vanish. Oh no, not Atkins, whatever shall we do without him? Truly, I want to see Pinhead emerge victorious over this insidious scheme. Leaving aside the goofy nature of a Hellraiser story that hinges on time travel by way of Quantum Leap as its primary plot vehicle, so far the story has been okay overall, just with a few annoying bits here and there. Plus the overall problem that we're mostly just watching bad guys fighting other bad guys and being expected to root for one of them because... They're the face of the franchise, I guess. When we left off, we were getting acquainted with an ancient Mayan version of Pinhead, so I guess we'll see how that works in this issue. Let's dig into Pinhead number 4-6 to six and see what it is Aggregate is after. And whether we should actually care about that.
Issue 4's cover is okay, featuring Pinhead in this form. The Warrior Topek, as he was called at the end of the last issue, carrying a weapon as well as a dude's severed head. This issue, everyone's head will roll. Pinhead's, yours, and mine. Okay, comic, you're winning me over with that pun. Well done. We open pretty much the same as the cover, though now Topek's holding the head in his other hand. In 1993, this temple is a rotting ruin in the jungle of Belize. But now, with our ruins restoration project, it'll become low-income housing. In 627 AD. Now. Today. If it was 628 AD, it would have been tomorrow. It is a house of worship, flourishing under the protection of the warrior Zyp Topek. Unfortunately, it's an election year, and Topek's stab-your-own-skull-with-pins platform is not going as well as hoped. After the high priest reminds him to thank the gods for their victory over an invading force, the attackers are all beheaded. The normal custom is to take the head of the losing captain, not those of the entire team, an inspired innovation warrior. Unfortunately, it makes the fantasy league for it a bit harder to play. Or, apparently this was all a training exercise for an attacking force that Pinhead says is coming. Now, I don't know anything about the Mayans, maybe this was a common practice, but I don't know, seems like cutting off the heads of any of your forces undergoing training is a poor tactical decision. It's like a more extreme version of that parody motivational poster. The beheadings will continue until morale improves. The high priest or whatever says that he's neglecting his role as religious leader of the community and wants to take up the job of handling predictions of the future so as not to confuse the people, since he hasn't seen any evidence of the incoming attack he's foretold. Pinhead says not to worry about it, and we cut to the inside of his mindscape, where, like the Monsignor, the actual Topek mind is fighting him for control of his body. Still, he does a better job of eventually convincing Topek that he's on the up and up and about the threat to Leviathan. My body is your weapon, self. Use it as a warrior would. Hookers and blow, gotcha. We cut over to hell today. Wait, I thought 627 AD was now today. What time is it? The remaining other Cenobites watching over Pinhead, which is like two now, Gehenna and Face, realize that things are getting worse now that both Atkins and Balbareth are gone. Face attributes this to them not being able to play the roles forced on them. I mean, Atkins is an utter failure in any time period, but Balbareth was doing just fine at the church. And wait, how do you guys even know what's going on in the past? Is there like a hell TV or something in this room magically letting you spectate? As such, Face assumes that what's required is for him to basically act whatever role is necessary as he's transported back to Mayan times. And I guess he needs to take off the skin face he wears? Back in 627, we learn that there's a cult within Topek City that actually worships Leviathan, probably a result of Topek's own manipulations of the time period. They plan to bring down the city from within when the invasion comes. On that note, we see that Aggregate has taken a different approach while seeking out the next puzzle configuration. They found another tribe of Mayans and armed them with advanced weaponry. No laser beams or anything, although it would be hilarious if they were that flagrant with the time travel, but more advanced bladed weapons and training methods that have turned this group into a conquering army. He convinces their leader that they should march on Topek City. Back in the city, the elders, or the high council or whatever, I don't know the political layout of ancient Mayans, observes Face, whose chosen role is as, like, an interpretive dancer in a bird mask. Okay, points to you, Face. I do not see Balbareth, and especially not Atkins, taking on that role, so you got me there. Hell, Atkins would probably curl up in a ball weeping if he was in an era when guns didn't exist. Anyway, the High Priest once again questions Topek's judgment about a coming invasion, and they get into an argument, with Face even saying that maybe they should just flay these assholes and get it done with. But Pinhead recognizes that there's a stronger strategic importance in keeping up the facade, so he defers to the High Priest while charging Face with the job of infiltrating the cult, that they might possess the puzzle configuration they seek. And indeed, Face is able to do so as the cult prepares some kind of ritual to summon the Black Light of Leviathan. Shining through from his endless and distant domain is not a simple task, even for a god. But we will ease the passage. Evil ritual to harvest a demon god's power, or constipation commercial. You make the call. Face joins up, although I do have to wonder if they find it suspicious that their dancer just 
wears the ceremonial bird helmet all the time. Face tells Pinhead about this later, apparently also showing off his collection of human faces he's been acquiring while in Mayan times. No one talks about the other upside of time travel, getting those rare collectibles back when they were common. When he tells Pinhead about the dark light from Leviathan, Captain Brainstab describes what the light actually is. Our Lord's own darkness. Within its roiling ebony, the remains of the souls that have fed its majesty for eternity. But mostly they're just full of cholesterol. That light should never escape. But if it did over time, if all those glimmers were to build back together into one malicious beam... I mean, maybe you're talking about something else, dude, but isn't Leviathan, like, always shooting out beams of black light? It's kind of the first thing we saw it doing in Hellraiser 2. Back with Aggregate, while they instruct the Mayan tribe on how to construct some kind of war engine to break through the city walls, they see in their own reflection a group of souls. It seems they're not just made of different body parts, but various souls fused together too. And they're starting to disagree about their course of action and how best to achieve their goals. Aggregate reasserts control to try to maintain harmony, lest the goals they've been working towards for centuries be undone. Back in the city, the High Priest uses a vision to learn that an invasion is indeed coming, but he says the will of the gods is that Topek will die while he assumes control. On top of that, the cult prepares to make their own move to expose the Light of Leviathan, picking face for the task of positioning a reflector near the water that's supposed to be the source of the light. In private with the others, he says it's because the light will destroy whoever is exposed to it first as a sacrifice. Besides, he does not strike me as having what is necessary to serve the Dark Lord. Leviathan craves giant fish masks, not birds. The next day, the High Priest makes his move and tries to kill Pinhead, but in the scuffle, Aggregate's forces launch their attack. In the struggle, Pinhead has Aggregate at his mercy, but he demands answers about what they are instead of just killing them, which pisses off the mind of Topek, since he's all about the killing. The hesitation allows Aggregate to get the upper hand, but fortunately Face, while dying from the black light, manages to re-aim it at Aggregate and blast them before they can kill Pinhead. Pinhead's mind is sent back in time just as the High Priest also takes this opportunity to behead Topek, because I guess he feels like the day just isn't complete without doing that. Bringing us to the next form, some kind of Bronze Age soldier with a big beard and... <laughs> okay, no. The variations on pins is one thing, but just shoving a million tiny swords into his head is kind of silly. It looks like he's got a bunch of those tiny sword-shaped toothpicks in his head. Issue 5's cover is... Fine, I guess. Pinhead in this form, waving around a sword while surrounded by skulls. Gehenna's in the background, just being a skeleton engulfed by flames. Kind of reminds me of the opening cutscene from Diablo 2. We open with Pinhead in this form, having sex with some woman. Nothing turns women on than looking like a blue Kratos, but with a bunch of tiny daggers stuck in your head. He is Hell's chosen son. He has, for millennia, served Leviathan's will, stood vanguard against the forces of chaos so that his dark god would triumph. But Leviathan's boobs are not as impressive as this woman's. In his mindscape, Pinhead is actually chaining this guy, Bel Alla, to the bottom of a lake. He's all, dude, what the hell? We're like total bros, bro. I could help you. It's a dick move, admittedly, but even Pinhead points out that he's too close to defeating Aggregate. He can't risk another previous incarnation screw him over like what happened the last two times. A shame, too, since this is the first one since Cowboy Pinhead who seemed amenable. Pinhead then kneels and makes the sacred prayer position to Leviathan, shaping your hands like you were Spider-Man shooting web lines. He's begging Leviathan for forgiveness because the farther he travels back in time, the more emotional he's getting. The previous lifetime somehow infecting him and removing his more ordered personality. I do like that part. Like I've said, Pinhead's appeal as a movie monster is that he's a talker like Freddy Krueger, but he's restrained and controlled. I am so exquisitely we don't know exactly what year he's arrived in, but the dialogue indicates that they're in Sumer, a few thousand years BC. The woman Pinhead is with, named Inanna, says that she, as a priestess in the cult of Ishtar, combined with his physical strength, could rule the country together. However, for the time being, she just wants to hear the story of the serpent and the eagle. Okay, well, once upon a time, Hydra used the cosmic cube to alter Captain America. 
The tale is actually more a metaphor for Pinhead's struggle against Aggregate, about an eagle and snake who, despite being old enemies, agreed to hunt a common enemy together. And the eagle betrayed the snake and ate the serpent's children while it was hunting. The serpent went before its god for justice and revenge. That is as much of the story as I know. Weird how you keep asking me to tell you a story that doesn't have an ending. But surely it must end. Make up an ending for me, Belala. The ending you would like to see. Very well. Okay, so the serpent was actually praying to Santa Claus, who had his elves assemble a Death Star that blasted the eagle with pinpoint precision, and the serpent was made the new King of Christmas. No, he just says the serpent uses guile and cunning to defeat the eagle. Later, Inanna is talking with a servant about how Ben Ala seemed confused and weak today. Unfortunately, it seems the servant is actually Aggregate, who encourages her to make up another ending to the story. Okay, so the eagle is actually rescued by six magical ponies who teach it about friendship. And later they fight Transformers. There's some more weird metaphor talk, but the point is that Aggregate kills another servant and then uses a technique to revive her, showing off their own power to Inanna and getting her interested in joining their side. More interestingly, though, is the fact that considering this is ancient Sumer, it's kind of weird that Inanna is a red-haired white girl. I tried to do research on this, but apparently the ethnicity of the ancient Sumerians is mostly speculation, though we can hazard a guess, since it's where Iraq is nowadays, that this is probably probably not common, especially when you put her right next to the revived servant with darker skin. So not impossible, but rather unlikely. Pinhead, meanwhile, is soon attacked by Gehenna, of all people, who has traveled back in time and is pissed that he's spending his time banging hot redheads instead of trying to do something about aggregate. I've come through time to find you, master. To find you lost in the arms of a whore. You know, for literal demons, you're using very judgmental language about sex workers. Gehenna accuses him of indulging in the emotions of his previous incarnation and decides to recount his origin. I can't remember if this was another anthology story as well. In some ancient times, he was part of a group that had daily child sacrifices to a volcanic pit. He'd give the kids herbs to put them to sleep to spare them the pain of what was happening. But then his own son was put there, and when the kid recognized him, the guards shoved said kid into the pit. He then spotted Leviathan within the flames and Pattern of Bones, where it promised to make up for what he'd lost. And it did so by... taking away all his flesh so that he was just a skeleton and tying him to a wooden board. Think you should have read the fine print on that contract, dude. Gehenna says that the transcendence of becoming a Cenobite has been an experience beyond the pain and suffering of losing his child, and fears that losing Leviathan will bring it all back to him. And now, a touching moment of Pinhead possessing a Mesopotamian warrior's body, hugging a skeleton. If that image doesn't bring you to tears, then you are just heartless. Much like Gehenna, actually. Inanna brings a strange ore to a blacksmith to make a metal stronger than bronze, but when the guy refuses to help until he's done with his own work, Aggregate comes in and beats the guy up. The ore drops into the smelting fire. Crawl away! There's no need of you now. The ore has found its mate! Wait, if all you needed were some hot coals, what was even the point of commissioning the blacksmith? Pinhead shows up, apparently knowing where they'd be, and Inanna... I don't know, like wax pinhead on the back of the head with a knife? It's not clear, but it takes him down for a moment. Gehenna tackles Inanna into the burning coals. Slut! You have cursed my master with indecision and weakness! You are literally a demon skeleton who used to toss children into volcanoes! You are really not in any position to be slut-shaming, jackass! Which is sad because, as I said, damn that's a cool design for a Cenobite. Gehenna rips out her heart and the dripping blood combines with the ore, aggregate reshaping it into an iron dagger. This was apparently a puzzle, I guess? In any case, in the struggle, aggregate is still able to gather enough energy to teleport back in time again. And then Pinhead, I guess, stabs himself? For some reason? And this teleports him to the end of the issue for our final part. Which, as you can see, involves Caveman Pinhead. Also, how the hell did Gehenna die in the fires? This isn't even like Director Bones in the DC Universe where I hyperbolically say he's a skeleton when he just has transparent flesh. Gehenna is literally a skeleton! What the hell? So, final cover, which is... okay. The Climactic Cro-Magnon Clash, as the text says, featuring Caveman Pinhead fighting Cave Person Aggregate. 
And Normal Pinhead is just standing in the background going, What the hell did I walk in on? We open with Caveman Pinhead covered in blood as he stacks bones in a triangular shape. Few people know that Pinhead invented Lincoln Logs. In the Mindscape, Pinhead obviously has no chance of reasoning with his caveman self, and thus, while the battle rages on in his mind, Caveman Aggregate arrives and knocks out his physical body. We wanted to love you, Chosen One, but you turned your back on us! And now there'll be hell to pay. Meanwhile, ten feet away, the Monolith is watching all this and thinking it may have made a grave mistake. In hell, everything is apparently falling apart. I say apparently because the narration says that Hell's order is decaying, but really all we have is like a line of naked people being forced towards Leviathan. The narration says that Leviathan needs to consume more and more souls to feed its machinery of war. Not that we know what that means. The naked people are kind of pissed since apparently they were hired to be Cenobites, not lunch, but any thought of rebellion is quickly whipped out of them. Back in the past, Caveman Pinhead is tied up and left for a vulture to tear at his flesh while Aggregate proceeds with his plan. In the Mindscape, Pinhead finally overcomes his counter part and takes control, allowing him to slip free and kill the vulture. Leviathan must be saved, and Aggregate stopped. Pinhead then transformed into a semi-truck while The Touch blasted on the soundtrack. So despite the fact that it's only his mind and essence that transports back in time, Pinhead still has the fragment from the pellucid lens in his loincloth. I'll just presume that the Monsignor has been wearing that same loincloth for thousands of years. Aggregate, in the meantime, ties all the puzzle configurations to a tree, as the narrator explains about an engineer in 1857 named Ostland, who discovered several puzzle devices like the Lament configuration and studied them. He combined the devices in various ways and came up with an intricate plan. The Ostland Construct, a blueprint for the destruction of hell. Patent pending. The final component of the construct is its fuel, the various souls that have combined into them. However it's supposed to work, it starts up, the pool of water that's nearby apparently pulling Leviathan through it and working to damage it. However, as Pinhead points out to himself, the construct is incomplete because the pellucid lens is missing a piece. In Hell, the Cenobites are shocked to see Leviathan drifting away. Leviathan, return to us! Lord, save us! In your name, Leviathan! Go, Web, go! So here's where we finally get the explanation of Aggregate and their motivation, which is why we apparently had that one-page interlude with the souls being fed to Leviathan. Basically, Aggregate is made up of various souls that were deemed not good enough to be part of its army and were trapped inside Leviathan to be fed off of. They manage to slowly remove pieces of themselves from Leviathan and join together into Aggregate to set forth this plan that will allow their souls to escape and be reborn on prehistoric Earth. In the process, Leviathan will be destroyed. However, Pinhead arrives and uses the focusing crystal to set fire to some brush. The hellish energy contained within the crystal, and in turn the fire it spawned, is then used on the puzzle components of the Ostland configuration, sending that energy straight into Leviathan and fixing the crack that the configuration had caused in it. The souls can no longer escape. Aggregate attacks, screaming that they just wanted to be Cenobites like him, to torture and maim. That is not what we are. Our order is one of experience, any and all, in the extreme. In that grand adventure, there is enlightenment. Admittedly, there is still a lot of the torture and maiming, but it's for the art, damn it! Aggregate is pissed because this entire experience has created them into their own being separate from the souls that make them up, and thus wants a chance for their own life, but Pinhead just easily tears them apart. The souls that had escaped are reabsorbed, accepting defeat and hoping that there's still some kind of hope for them in the future, and they really have no chance against the angry caveman who sticks bones in his head. Time itself seems to start fixing itself, since it's obvious the puzzles will be returned to their proper places which somehow leads to Atkins and Balbareth being restored in caveman times. Brothers who sacrifice their immortality to thwart your transgressions, face in Gehenna, they may be forever lost to hell. Oh good, we lose two cooler, more interesting Cenobites, but Atkins gets to come back! Thank Leviathan! I was worried we'd never get to see him again! Cenobite me, comic! Pinhead says he appreciates Aggregate's passion and tenacity, would even make for good Cenobite material, but they're too new to the concept of self-awareness and individuality, so he tells Atkins to destroy them. 
Attend to him, armorer. Payback's a bitch, isn't it? Shut up! Hell, today. Whatever that means in a place where damnation is eternal. This is the timeline in the afterlife. Happens to kind of look like the name Jeremy Barami in Curse of English. Pinhead and the other two Cenobites reappear in Ludovico's lab and confront his remains. He expects to be tortured for what he's done, but Pinhead just responds that this experience has reaffirmed his mission. And that's definitely more torture for Ludovico, who wanted to hurt the Cenobites and Leviathan not help them in any way. And so our comic ends with Pinhead grinning and walking away. A final warning to one and all. Walk the straight and narrow, kiddies, and steer clear of pins and puzzle boxes. That's it from all of us in this corner of hell. Evil wins, kids! This comic is... okay. Like I said last time, there aren't a lot of truly bad Hellraiser books. Really, the issues with this are more... philosophical than anything else. I mean, as I said last time, this is a story where we are supposed to be rooting for the bad guys. I know it's a common complaint about slasher movies and the like, where we're in theory more into the villain than into the people they're killing, but that's usually only the case if we find the victims to be annoying or terrible in their own right. And even then, that's more of a failing of screenwriting than of the horror genre in itself. We're not supposed to be on the side of the villains in these stories, Sure, of course we want to see the villains appear and do their thing because there's tension and fear and excitement and all, but actually wanting the forces of hell to succeed and continue torturing and feeding souls to Leviathan? Eh, it just seems like a misstep. You need to explain why their way is preferable to what Aggregate and the others want. Like, they'll do more damage to the timeline being left in caveman times or something. Hell, poor Aggregate just wanted their own chance to experience things as an individual and that got screwed over. But there's nothing majorly wrong with the story itself. Sure, I've pointed out the weirdness of the time travel plot, but if you can get past that, we have a wide variety of characters and locations, various individuals with strong motivations and interesting, unique dynamics for each issue that keep it from getting boring or bogged down. It's very well constructed, and the artwork for the 90s is pretty decent for most of the book. Its biggest strength is world building, expanding the philosophy of the Cenobites while showing Pinhead throughout history influencing things in ways that correlate with their mission. Sure, it's a little weird that Pinhead apparently existed in forms separate from a summoning puzzle like the Lament configuration, but I don't think there's really that much in the movie's lore to suggest that isn't possible. It's not what I come to Hellraiser for, but it's a fairly solid story in its own right. Atkins is still the worst, though. Next time, let's see how Pinhead can handle matters in a crossover of all things. It's Pinhead versus Martial Law. Hello and welcome to A SHOCK THE FOURTH WALL! Well, it's time to put an end to the Hellraiser comic reviews. While everything we've looked at has been pretty much from the Epic Comics line, I feel like we've gotten a nicely diverse range of stories. From holiday specials to just straight-up anthologies, from an interesting story lacking Pinhead except as a background cameo, to an entire weird miniseries devoted to him, Hellraiser as a franchise has worked out a lot better in comics than, say, The Thing or Silent Hill. Hell, even a Nightmare on Elm Street, you have to fudge the timeline a bit for some of the better stories in the Wildstorm comics to work. Hellraiser, though, has a storytelling engine that doesn't even require its central elements, Pinhead, the Lament configuration, or characters like Kirsty to actually appear in them. Sure, in the movies you'd be hard-pressed to have a Hellraiser movie without Pinhead, but even in Hellraiser Judgment he was more of a minor player for most of the movie, an authority figure that another order of demons went to. And it can be argued that his presence was that much more powerful by the restraint in using him. Thus, Hellraiser in comics, while some like the Boom Studios books are all about those original elements from the first two movies, have been able to do more and be more consistently enjoyable than in other horror franchises we've seen on this show. But one thing we haven't explored yet, but that we'll close things out on is... CROSSOVERS! It's been said that one of the proposed endings for Freddy vs. Jason would have seen the titular slashers dragged back to hell, only for Pinhead to chain them up and ask, Gentlemen, 
What seems to be the problem? An awesome idea for a setup that would be on par with Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash, since Pinhead is the next perfect addition for a matchup with those two. You've got one talking killer who's all jokes, one completely silent, and one to act as the straight man while still being immensely powerful himself. Sadly, while that would never happen, Epic Comics did have two crossovers for Hellraiser. The first was Hellraiser vs. Nightbreed, Jihad, which pit the Cenobites against the monsters of Clive Bar Parker's lesser celebrated creation. Some were disappointed I wasn't covering that one, but I just don't know enough about Nightbreed to really dive into it. Instead, the crossover we're looking at is an entirely different series I don't know enough about. Martial Law. Martial Law is another book that came out of Epic Comics and created by Pat Mills. Mills had been one of the people behind the 2000 AD book in England and, in turn, helped develop Judge Dredd. Apparently, Martial Law was something of a parody of Judge Dredd, Except in this case, the ultra-violence was focused not on criminals, but superheroes. In this world, superheroes and superpowered beings are much more common, with most of the U.S. Army's forces being superpowered to the point where they don't feel pain anymore. And apparently this led to widespread sadism, where they inflict pain on others simply because they can't feel it themselves. The character of martial law was one such soldier, but while he's outwardly a douchebag, he has a strong moral compass and was disgusted by the horrors of war and atrocities committed by superheroes during his time in the army. Thus later, he became employed by the government to hunt down and kill superheroes who had gone rogue. The original miniseries saw martial law trying to take down public spirit, basically the equivalent Superman slash Captain America pastiche as I understand it. Also, he's apparently a big fan of Hunter S. Thompson given what he wrote on his stomach. Look, I've made no secret of it. I have no patience for this kind of story or character. The thing about these sort of superhero deconstructions is that they have two repeated qualities ad nauseum. One, the failure to acknowledge that we already have a term for those who use extraordinary powers to commit horrible crimes. Super villains! And two, they always push their stories into edgelord, grotesque extremes to try to make us be on the side of those who hate superheroes. It's not enough for a corrupted superhero to just be greedy or prejudiced or a bit cruel. No, 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 no. Superheroes are either naive idiots that just stepped out of a Silver Age comic, or they're pedophiles who bathe in the blood of puppies that they had sex with earlier that day and are ready to graphically torture people for page after page before sleeping on a bed made of dead kittens and laughing maniacally at how they can get away with anything, because who would be stupid enough to actually think that someone is interested in helping people, am I right? And there are plenty of deconstructions out there that work. Watchmen, Squadron Supreme, The Mighty, Kingdom Come, just off the top of my head. But these kind of stories turn superheroes into the kind of people that even Cenobites would say, Dude, could you tone it down a bit? There's certainly a place and an audience for these kind of stories, but it's not me. I frickin' love superheroes, and I reject outright deconstructions and satire like martial law or the boys. Stuff made by people who hate them. It's not for me. But that brings us to the more interesting question. How does a world of superheroes, even a satirical one like this, interact with a franchise like Hellraiser? Well, let's dig into Pinhead vs. Martial Law and take a look. First issue's cover is... kind of bleh. Done more in martial law style, obviously. It's this weird red embossed thing with Pinhead and Law just grappling with each other, and Pinhead looks terrible. Just like some generic angry dude with some pins in his face. Much like the first issue of the Pinhead miniseries, it feels 90s in the worst ways. The title page is... Well, what would happen if Pinhead and Martial Law fused, I guess, with lots of chains and hooks hanging off of him? Massively oversized pins in his gimp-masked face, and whatever the hell that gun is. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. Book one! Hell for Leather! Man, I would instantly love this comic if it turned out it was just about Martial Law going clothes chopping. By the way, the phrase hell for leather just means as fast as possible, which is incredibly ironic since this book gets really slow given the content later. We truly open with Marshall going around in his flying car. I was promised flying cars. And narrating about how he has lost his girlfriend and it filled him with emptiness and loneliness, but has met a new woman who he might be in love with. Only trouble is, she's a superheroine. Her name is Supernova. And she's brightened up my life because she exploded. 
Flying really presses my buttons, you know. Duck or a frisbee, if it flies, it turns me on. Your new girlfriend wants to have sex with a frisbee or a duck, Marshall. These are not relationship goals. She admits that Marshall reminds her of her father, a flying superhero who wore a mask and always wore it all the time, so she never got to see his face. She also might want to have sex with her dad. I can see how your life has been brightened. But no, he's apparently into that and says, Come to daddy. Before they have sex in the plane. So, you know, he's full of good decisions today. I know, I know. A lot of people will call me a hypocrite. Well, mostly I'll call you an idiot for doing this while in flight. I'm meant to be a superhero hunter. But first and foremost, I'm a man. I am a man! <laughs> hey, hey, those are mine. Are we ever going to actually do my show? Yes, late night double feature is going to happen, Clive! They land at what I think is supposed to be a parody of Four Freedoms Plaza from Marvel, except in this case, it's a number five inside of a question mark. I kind of actually dig that design idea, even if the execution is lacking. Anyway, once there, Supernova explains that one of her powers is actually a powerful form of telepathy. She can make mental contact with not only other galaxies, but other dimensions. That's how I met the Dark Ones. Dark Ones? You know, YouTube commenters. No, she made contact with the Cenobites. Cenobites. Demons, you'd call them. They're battling for control of Earth. And if they win, this planet goes. What's at stake is eternal damnation. I'm trying to communicate with them. Do a deal, because that's how I see myself. As a systems buster. I want to bust their whole plan wide open. By... negotiating with them? I feel so much love for the Cenobites. Love for demons? Yes, because they are our missing half. In order to be whole again, we must unite with them. Feel their pain. You're kind of an idiot, aren't you? Oh, and just to really show off the edgelordy quality here, enjoy this sequence of Superman being tortured by Cenobite versions of his rogues gallery. I feel their suffering. So much pain and unhappiness. Nah, that's just me after having to read anything involving Atkins. Supernova's definitely out to lunch, but I've got my luncheon vouchers. And box of condoms. You can't eat that. Marshall says he doesn't understand any of that, but just asks her to be careful, which... Wow, Marshall's a more supportive boyfriend than like 90% of other characters in fiction. They're at the tower to attend a superhero therapy party. Now, one might think, oh, hey, is this comic actually going to address the concept of mental health and superheroes better than frickin' Heroes in Crisis did? Eh, not really. Both are terrible, just on opposite sides of the spectrum. Heroes in Crisis at least acknowledge that mental health concerns are an issue for superheroes. This book just says, Therapy for superheroes is people being self-indulgent hedonistic morons in the guise of help. For instance, hot tub therapy, which is just a dude having sex with a mermaid in a hot tub. Color therapy, wherein they add color to darker costumes. And a form of therapy where it's getting enemas to try to revert you to a regular human. Well, I always knew superheroes were full of sh**. Considering how much of it comes out of your mouth, you would know. After an encounter with someone who wants him to drink piss for urine therapy, they meet up with Seraph, an angel-themed superhero whom Supernova is into. Probably because of the wings, honestly. Supernova's been feeling a little sick, but Seraph seems to radiate some kind of energy that heals her. While Marshall disapproves of the holier-than-thou attitude, though this guy seems perfectly polite, Marshall accepts that maybe his dickish attitude is hurting Supernova. She decides to go to one of Seraph's workshops to look after her own health a bit, Marshall in tow. At said workshop, Tonight, I want to show you how you can step free through grace into other dimensions, to ascend into a new and marvelous realm beyond time and space. Oh, good thing we're starting small here. However, he says the means by which they can ascend is through a lament configuration. He claims that people will be transformed by the radiant light as it changes one's molecular resonance or whatever, but that others will be tormented by it if they refuse to accept it. Somehow, the close proximity of the box causes Supernova to fall over and have difficulty breathing. Seraph claims to heal her as she hyperventilates, but then wants to adjust her aura a bit leading to Marshall punching him away. The other heroes in the workshop pull him back. Marshall, Seraph's only trying to help her. He wouldn't lie. He's a good guy. He's got wings. There is logic in what he says. 
Seraph claims the box will deal with your pain at a subatomic level within the DNA and soul itself, enabling you to go through the pain barrier into the higher realms. Somehow, I feel like even if this didn't summon Pinhead, that Seraph would be experiencing some pain barriers himself soon. Marshall decides to give it a shot and opens the box, although instead of summoning the Cenobites, this one transports Marshall and Supernova to hell. They're confronted by this Cenobite, who might actually look cool in live action. Some kind of dude with hooks sticking out of him, but more interestingly, a bunch of IV bags hanging over him. What are your hidden fears that you deny even to yourself, Marshall? Fear of disease and decay? Sleeveless t-shirt, your torso is warm. What of your arms? Marshall just shoots the Cenobite and Seraph moves on to other possible fears. First up is fear of castration, which Marshall just kicks the Cenobite in the balls and stabs him with his own giant clock tower scissors. And then fear of the beast, meaning some kind of weird dinosaur Cenobite, which while cool in concept, just looks like a T-Rex with a few bits of metal sticking out. I want a proper dinosaur Cenobite now. And finally, Seraph realizes this is going nowhere, so instead goes for fear of someone else's pain and takes Supernova hostage. Seraph's facade quickly vanishes, revealing that he too is some kind of Cenobite. No doubt you are imagining all the unspeakable things I'm going to do to her, Marshall. For your own brain is the supreme torturer. The brain never gives you peace. And my brain hurts. Ah, I see you've read Marvel then. That would be a torture of hell. An excellent initiation into hell, Seraph. This martial law is indeed a worthy offering on account for your continued existence. I'm not technically allowed to torture Atkins, so this is the next best thing. And yep, Pinhead is finally here. And weird sequential art decision here. These two panels show Pinhead in shadow, then from behind at the bottom of the page. You'd think that would mean this is the big dramatic reveal of Pinhead on the next page. Take up the whole thing, or maybe just a large panel for the reveal, but... Nope. Close up of his T-zone, then a pullback of just his face. Weird. The fears Seraph introduced you to perform a vital function. For fear is essential to the human race. Only through fear can blessed order be maintained. Yes, my fear of dinosaurs truly does keep me on the structured path. Without it, humans would not work, go to war, or obey their leaders and instead lie idly in the dirt, succumbing to the wasteful disease of chaos. And here's where Pinhead starts shilling his self-help book. That is why, through countless millennia in the name of our beloved Leviathan, we Cenobites have inoculated the human race with fear for their own good, inserting it deep into the DNA itself. Fears of reptiles, insects, darkness, but above all, fear of pain. Yeah, nobody would be afraid of pain without you, dude. Apparently the Cenobites are like breeding children to carry irrational fears, and this will lead to order, I guess? You fragging bastards, you're behind all the misery of the world. Of course. Of course! Our Lord always intended the Earth to be a veil of tears. Hey, remember when Cenobites were just a bunch of freaky looking demon things who shoved some chains into ya because they didn't understand the difference between pain and pleasure? And now apparently they're the cause of literally all misery on Earth? I thought you'd be pleased, Marshall, for judging by your tasteful SS style uniform, you appear the very symbol of order and control. You got that wrong, pal. I'm no Nazi. Jeez, you dress up like a Nazi and suddenly everyone thinks you're a Nazi. Marshall punches Pinhead all of once because we need Pinhead to monologue some more. Supernova wants to know why they can't just live peacefully, but Pinhead says her naivete is nice because they like to destroy such innocence. Supernova's confused because she sensed so much pain the Cenobites were in, but said Cenobites just say it's fun for them. I don't understand. Why does your god want all this misery? Why is he so obsessed with order? It is not for you to question the mysterious ways of the divine divider and ruler, the Lord Leviathan. Well, I guess that helps explain why you thought that nails in your peripheral vision was a good idea. 
Marshall says that attempting to make a deal with them is what got her sick to begin with, which Pinhead confirms. Making deals with demons always has a price that screws you over. We're gonna find Spider-Man's soul here being tortured by Cenobites, aren't we? Pinhead proceeds to show a bunch of people who opened the Lament Configuration, hoping to get superpowers like that public spirit guy. And ended up here in hell to be tortured while wearing the costume. No doubt you're enjoying this, Marshall. No, they're not suffering enough! Give them more pain! They're meant to be superheroes! They can take it! Gotta love that overwhelming compassion for innocent people who just wanted to have powers to do good, Marshall. You've got the same gentle soul as the Fixer. Thank goodness we're supposed to be rooting for you! After recapping how Public Spirit got people to sign on for all the stuff I talked about at the beginning in Marshall's backstory, Marshall finally has enough and just shoots at Pinhead. With the harpoons that were apparently in his gun. He then stabs Seraph and takes Supernova so they can try to escape. Run, Marshall? How absurd. You are in hell. You won't get anywhere without public transportation. They unleash all the people who were being tortured to attack Marshall. Not sure how that works, but whatever, it's hell. But Marshall is just happy to keep killing people who look like public spirit. Pinhead realizes that there's a deeper pain inside of Marshall, and summons up the image of all those he killed in war, and assisted by war Cenobites, creatures that resemble brutal aspects of military combat. He speechifies about how language is used in war too, to desensitize its aspects calling horrific burns, thermal injuries, grenades that shoot white-hot shards of metal through bone and flesh, area denial weapons, lung damage from poison gas, respiratory embarrassment, etc, etc. The end result is that Marshall and Supernova are knocked out. Marshall is taken to some kind of hellish surgical theater where Pinhead is the doctor, and has an outrageously huge chainsaw with 18-inch terror saw written on it because apparently there's no superhero in martial law named Subtlety Man. He starts performing surgery on Law to extract the shrapnel that was shot into him without anesthetic. As I was saying, the language of pain is all about denial, which is not just a river in Africa. You really wanted to make Freddy vs. Martial Law, didn't you? Supernova is tied to an X-Cross and handed over to Seraph. Issue 1 ends with a bunch of various tools and sharp objects ready to be stabbed into him. And now, Marshall, it's time for a surgical strike. Are you sure you don't need some more sharp objects? I think there might be a few stray atoms that don't get stabbed. Cover for issue two. Well, as you may have noticed, I don't have the physical copies of these comics, and the scans are not exactly the best out there. I think it's like some holofoil slash embossed thing with Martial Law's badge, but added in some pinhead details, like San Frachuro Pain Department or whatever. This is awful and kind of lame. We open where we left off, only now the stylized artwork has decided to take a step down for Pinhead. In the first issue, he still mostly maintained his calm demeanor, but on this page he looks like he's ranting and screaming at the top of his lungs with Gowron eyes. And he just talks, 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 and my eyes just glaze over, partly from the art that's so energized that it's hard to focus, but also because it's saying nothing. Just because Pinhead is a monster who speaks doesn't mean he has to so much in these books. That's the thing, even when Pinhead is used a lot more in the Hellraiser movies, they make sure to keep what he's saying relatively simple so that it commands more power. Not telling jokes and babbling about how much he's going to torture martial law to understand more about him. Supernova once again asks why they're doing this. Well, Seraph licks at her boob through her costume. Thanks, comic! That's totally necessary! I have to censor it just to be on the safe side for YouTube, even though she's fully clothed, but it's already just a why kind of thing. Anyway, Seraph says the questions are distractions, but Pinhead disagrees. Let us answer her. For ignorance is bliss, and that is not a state we favor in hell. Which is why earlier I said we should not ask questions of Leviathan. I make a lot of sense. Watch, my dear. I have such sights to show you. Pinhead proceeds to pull out his vacation photos. He apparently summons Leviathan here and floating above the surgical theater, explaining that it nourishes itself on fear and trauma and the suffering of humanity. Wars were organized to create that fear and misery, but the masses needed to be pushed towards it, thus the purpose of order. So it's less about order as a philosophical point and more about serving Leviathan brunch. 
We also see images of Captain Spencer in World War I, as well as people injured during it. Martial Law notices that Pinhead seems to have a reaction to the war images. Leviathan feeds on human consciousness? That's horrible! Is it? The food you exist on contains animal and plant consciousness, to whose fate you are equally indifferent. Tell me, my dear, when did you last spare a thought for the soya beans that comprise your veggie burger? Oh god, they are using Marvel's bullcrap to torture people! Back on Earth, the remaining heroes at the workshop apparently have found like, a giant lament configuration. The heroes still want to attain the ascension that Seraph talked about, but know there's great danger. As such, they've called on Martial Law's assistant to help. A dude named Razorhead, who literally has a giant razor blade on his head. I've never understood why heroes always want to save the world or gain ultimate power. Why can't they behave like normal people? Yeah, no one wants to save the world. They should act like normal people and stick giant razor blades on their heads. I mean, my idea of a good time is to trap some geek down a dark alley, tell him I'm not gonna hurt him, then slice him up real slow, while I watch the shocked look on his face. I see that Atkins has an equivalent in this universe. Okay, there is admittedly a bit of satire from this guy that I like. Better pretend I'm as strange as they are. Fortunately, I speak fluent cliché too. We must strike now! It's a slim chance, but the only one we've got! That is actually legit funny. You get one point, comic. They somehow force the box open and enter, immediately transported to hell. They encounter some Cenobites and lose a couple of their number, but the others actually ignore the rest because they think Razorhead is a Cenobite from some neighboring hell and don't want to spoil his fun. Back with Pinhead, Superheroes serve a most useful function, Marshal. They provide the cannon fodder for Lord Leviathan. With their brightly colored costumes and effortless powers, they glorify war. No they don't, Pindick! Go to heaven! and act as valuable role models for the sheep-like masses to emulate. Marshall manages to break free as he proclaims that as much as he hates to admit it, he's a superhero too. The only one too dumb to buy the bullsh- Too dumb to- You're too dumb to buy the- But- But you think that superheroes are- This comic is dumb. The only one that wanted the job of turning on his own. The only one to like dressing up in an SS Stormtrooper uniform. And yet they dare to call me a Nazi! And we get a look at the back of Marshall's outfit, which reads, Dressed to Kill. What sort of backwards fucking pageantry is that? He breaks Supernova out, who's rightly pissed at the Cenobites, thinking they're full of it about the idea that evil rules the world. Um... No, they didn't say they rule it, they said they encouraged activities that help it. There is a difference. Pinhead and Martial Law get into a fist fight and fall into some giant vat of blood, the Cenobites scoffing at Supernova's attitude. And sooner or later, we must all break our hymen of innocence. You know, Hellraiser frequently has shots of hooks and chains pulling at flesh, tearing into skin, and yet it's this comic that feels gross. Pinhead gets impaled on multiple spikes, but easily emerges from it unscathed. Ah, such rapturous pain. And know that everything we were taught, everything we believed in, were prepared to die for, was a lie. A bloody lie! I know, right? I mean, I order the regular chicken nuggets, but they make them in the same stuff as the spicy ones, so they end up tasting spicy anyway. Everything we know is a lie. Marshall and Supernova run off, but Pinhead says they can't escape because they opened the box. And the orchestra of hell is already tuning up its instruments. And, yeah, we see these, like, music-based Cenobites. Welcome to the Symphony of Suffering. Begin the Taylor Swift rap album. With more misery than the finest Italian opera. A concerto of chastisement, where your screams will reach notes higher than the most falsetto boy soprano. Translation, padding, 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 padding. 
Marshall realizes that there seemed to be a touch of humanity about Pinhead in regards to World War I, so he thinks if they can somehow access that, they may be able to reach him and get away to escape hell. They head to the Abbey, the place where Supernova first made contact with the Cenobites, and thinks the records of who Pinhead was beforehand might be stored there. Because we need to move the plot along. The Abbey is their idea of a perfectly ordered universe, which apparently in Hell's opinion means designed by Tim Burton. And the files themselves are... weird. Basically, the information travels in the form of sound waves that can be transformed into geometric shapes and slapped onto a giant lament configuration. I'd make a joke about how paper would be more efficient, but this is hell, and overcomplicated bureaucracy and paperwork are kind of a hellish thing, so... They somehow access it and get the info on Captain Spencer, creating a bunch of large images of the whole thing around them. Pinhead arrives and Marshall admits he wants to get to his humanity. You flatter yourself, Marshall. What humanity? What feelings? I don't know, whatever ones that have been shown earlier with your angry expression, or just two panels ago when you were pissed that they were accessing your records? If you want a character to be emotionless, maybe you shouldn't keep having them show emotion! The image of Captain Spencer recounts what he experienced in World War I, particularly the Battle of the Somme, which took place over four months and resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths, and all just for six miles of territory. Pinhead berates Marshall that he would think that this would elicit some pity from him, since instead these experiences led him to Leviathan and the hell he enjoys so much. Pinhead suggests that maybe they should look at Marshall's past lives before his current existence. That's a thing here? And how little things on us are usually a sign of some horrible fate in past lives, like acne meaning bubonic plague, or asthma that you were once smothered or buried alive. So does having to read this garbage mean that I once had my eyes boiled or something? The World War I simulation is apparently still happening around them, and the other heroes arrive. Because this story hates superheroes, they're all morons who don't know how to navigate the trenches of World War I. Getting shot, stuck in barbed wire, poisoned by gas, etc. Pinhead calls them idiots for thinking they can achieve anything in real war. Exactly! These costumed bozos with their posing pouches, constipated glares, and inflatable muscles insult the memory of your dead comrades! Oh my god! Green Lantern stopped a giant robot from destroying the city! Clearly this is disrespecting the troops! Yes, they were real heroes. Real supermen. Ignored by posterity because their uniforms weren't colorful enough. Oh, get off the cross. We need the wood. Marshall says he's the one doing something about it. Wiping out the imposters and the phonies, and he asks Pinhead to let him, Razorhead, and Supernova go so he can continue his work. Pinhead agrees, saying they'll entertain themselves by torturing the heroes here for all eternity. The two even frickin' shake hands. They're returned to the tower, where the heroes there are apparently still engaged in their therapy or something. Marshall tells Razorhead that they have work to do now, but Supernova's shocked that he would still want to do all this stuff. Embrace pain and misery like the Cenobites. It's a long bit of rambly bullshit crap, but basically she just says that he needs to let go of his hatred of superheroes and choose love, but he refuses. As such, she breaks up with him. And so our comic ends with Marshall accepting that you can't dictate what people should think or do, and then they join in on some big orgy with a bunch of naked women, because poorly drawn boobs is satire or something. These comics suck. This was already a hard sell for me because I'm not fond of this particular kind of story, but even setting aside the premise, it's just a really annoying, edgelord, pretentious pile of crap. Page after page after page after page of people expositing about pain and suffering and war and how it all feeds the machine of order, man, and superheroes are the real problem. Especially that middle finger of an ending that suggests that superheroes distract people from celebrating soldiers. There's a lot you can critique about the concept of superheroes. Power fantasies, reinforcing ideas of violence being the solution to problems, unrealistic standards of beauty, co-opting the symbols of heroism for hatred, and more like that. But what kind of a joy-kill, snooty, nose-up-your-own-asshole, smug puss bucket do you have to be to say that superheroes keep people from celebrating real heroes? That's like saying, oh, John McClane from Die Hard? I hate that character. He distracts us from celebrating real-life nurses. They have nothing to do with each other.
A lot of the book just feels like padding. Even if you enjoyed the more first-year philosophy student stuff, what the hell was the point of the symphony of suffering? Or the lol, here's some weird therapy where people drink piss bits. And then there's the art, of course. Kevin O'Neill is actually widely celebrated for stuff like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and the Green Lantern story that was the basis of Blackest Night Later. And as such, I know he has better moments than this. But yeah, I'm not a fan of his style, and it's pretty ugly to look at here. Like Scott McDaniel, too high energy in every panel, too exhausting to read, and very distracting in more than one point. When he's good, he's brilliant, but when he's bad, he's just got really stretchy cartoon characters everywhere that are off-model and terrible to look at. And he does have his moments here, but few and far between. I do actually think there would be something to Cenobites vs. Superheroes, but definitely not this. This was awful, and I hate it, and it makes me glad we are done with Hellraiser comics. Next time, let's celebrate that ending, as well as celebrate the 12th anniversary with some more of the Clone Saga. There is the stench of chaos. Teenagers.